Okay, welcome everybody. I apologize. It's Laura Caps. I apologize for the delay. Uh, we had a robust um, closed session with um, uh, many parents uh, talking with us to the board um, about transfers and so forth because of the time of year we are at with our last uh, board meeting before school starts next Tuesday. So it's an exciting time. I apologize for the delay. Uh, thanks to the public for being here. Thanks to the board members, to our staff. Again, I'm going to say it every time, but we wish we could be in person and we look forward to that time. Uh, so with that, it is 643 and I'm calling to order uh, the, the meeting of the Board of Education on August 11th. Again, the last meeting before the exciting beginning of the school year. Uh, so with that, uh, Ms. Maldonado, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And then I will in uh, introduce our Spanish interpretation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Maldonado. And now, Ms. Rubicalva, if you could please walk us through the steps for uh, language access. Thank you, Board President Caps. Good evening. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bi-directional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you don't have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you're on a laptop or desktop, you will see a globe at the bottom right of your screen. Please click on the globe icon that says interpretation and select English. If you are on an iPad or a similar device like your phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace as the interpreter will be interpreting simultaneously into the other language. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o dispositivo parecido como su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas y elija español. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado, ya que la intérprete estará interpretando simultáneamente al otro idioma. Gracias. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, then I will ask the host to please click on interpretation and assign me as an interpreter. And we may begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bacalva. So now with item, uh, with item, Let's see, we need to read out the, um, the closed session, se session actions, which is item four. Uh, so I turn to you, Dr. Reed. Okay, just one moment. I'm sorry, my agenda. disappeared. So item four. So excuse me, Ms. Caps, but isn't it something that we're doing in the, as an action item? Yes, I threw you off there, I'm sorry. It's sometimes when we have a hard time, I just confess, when we have a hard time getting into the Zoom at the beginning of the meeting, I get a little thrown off myself, so I apologize. Um, but we will, uh, you're right. Uh, the one action that is uh, to be announced is the one that I'm going to be announcing, which is um, um, the appointment of our new assistant superintendent for elementary education, Anna Escobedo. 
and that um, action was taken in closed session. We will introduce her at the next meeting, but the motion was made by Ms. Sims Moten and seconded by Ms. Ford, and it was passed unanimously. So we're excited to welcome a new assistant superintendent, and we'll let the public and all of you know, and including introducing her at our next board meeting. So apologies to you, Dr. Reed, but you'll be hopefully all set for when this comes up in the action agenda. <laughs> Okay, so now uh, I'm getting set here, returning to um, regular action, and um, uh, that brings us to the uh, superintendent's report. Ms. Maldonado. I promise I'm a, I'm a pro at this, <laughs> to mute myself. Good evening, everyone, board members and the public. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Buenas noches a todos. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Uh, just a couple of uh, points, uh, board members, um, as you may have been keeping track of the COVID infection rate in our county um, and the rate reporting has been compromised in this, at the state level due to glitches in their state systems. And at this point, the state and county rates are really not aligned. This was from our morning meeting with the superintendents uh, in our county. Um, and so we will be looking for additional information as it, as it in, um, impacts COVID infection rates. This is important because many have uh, questions that have come to us about the governor's elementary waiver process. And at this time, we've been informed that the current rates in Santa, in Santa Barbara County would not qualify Santa Barbara Unified due to those uh, unfavorable rates. However, we will continue to monitor and provide updates as conditions change. We know this is an important topic and we uh, will continue to follow it closely. As you know, back to school is next week and our so some um, district employees are also starting to come back and we continue to engage in a process to ensure that everyone's safety is uh, first and foremost. I've been visiting schools this week. I've been uh, observing some teachers coming in to prepare their materials in their classrooms. Teachers have expressed to me that they are excited to come back and teach from their classrooms. I also wanna commend this board and leadership because we are implementing for the first time ever the ethnic studies graduation requirement for all ninth graders and are one of the first districts in the state of California to implement this class as a requirement. Additionally, this Thursday, August 13th, I'll be welcoming our teachers to the first official professional learning. Um, I know that some schools had already invested in some time for teachers to come back early. And on Thursday, we'll have a chance to kick off our official learning, uh, professional learning for teachers. Parents also um, reminder that registration will continue. I wanna encourage all parents to let us know how we can help to enroll their child in a different way given our current environment and what are some ways that we can improve our systems. And I also would be remiss if I didn't tell you that um, we have been um, missing an incredible opportunity to recognize La Cuesta High School. This summer, La Cuesta High School and their staff received news that they have received the highest possible WASC accreditation status, a six-year accreditation with no midterm visit. So maybe we can just give them some happy hands, some claps. Uh, congratulations to La Cuesta, and we hope to bring their team forward at our next meeting so that we can properly recognize them. Um, tomorrow morning, I will be speaking to in welcoming all new teachers to Santa Barbara Unified. And I wanted to share a video to welcome them and to congratulate them for choosing this great profession. The video was created for Ms. Angelopoulos by Mrs. Remorenko. And I want to uh, end the comments by sharing this video from parents to, to the teacher during the spring distance learning plan. And I wanna show this video because it shows the great care and creativity that we can all use to stay connected and remind ourselves of why we choose to become educators, which is our students. I wanna thank uh, the parents that created this video. Of course, in, if I had all the time in the world, I wanna recognize every single educator in this district and of course, thank all their parents. Um, but thank you for this opportunity and I'd like to ask Mr. Rouse to please share just a little snippet of the video and congratulate the teacher and parents. Oh, we're not 
You're a great teacher. I miss you. I miss you, Miss A. Hope, hope you're having a good time, not a hard time. Love you. Miss you. I miss you. I, I hope you, you're good with your family. Thank you for um for doing all the things to be smart. Thank you for listening. Bye. I would say thank you for being my teacher. I really appreciate it. We wouldn't have anything to replace you. Anything. Bye. I would say miss you. I'm missing you in the classroom. Happy teacher appreciation day. You rock. So again, creative ways to engage and appreciate. And I know that I, our teachers are working hard to do the same when their students come back to class next week. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maldonado. Uh, Mr. Rouse, if you could help out board member Sims Moten. She, I believe, is in needs to be allowed in as a panelist. So if you could help with that, that'd be awesome. And with that, I wanna also turn it over to all five of us, if there's any board comments or correspondence to share with the community. Ms. Ford. Oh, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, I just want, well, that was very emotional, that little snippet. Um, I want to congratulate Ms. Maldonado for a really successful and inspiring beginning of what I believe is hopefully a long career at SBUSD. I also just want to extend my deepest gratitude to the cabinet, leadership, staff, teachers who have worked so hard in the past few weeks uh, to make distance learning implementation as thoughtful, as data focused, and exciting as possible. Because aside from the terrible effects of this pandemic and, and the devastating loss of life, the beginning of this beginning of the school year, this August, is the strangest I've ever seen. The high levels of stress and anxiety and fear of COVID-19 are deeply present at a time when there's usually such a feeling of hope and anticipation for a new school year. I'm sure there are so many teachers, staff, and administrators who are missing those sunny, end of the summer, wonderful feelings of welcome back to friends and colleagues and then to see their actual students' faces as they come on campus. So I know we had a lot of intense debate over the past month about the decision to go with distance learning, but it really is the right decision, especially if you were able to see the LA Times report yesterday that the coronavirus cases among children and teenagers are surging in California now, up 150% uh, in July, more than twice the percentage of the surge across this country. And young people are over 10% of all the cases in California. So with that in mind, I just wanted to take my time to encourage and really implore our community to put aside the debates and disagreements about what's best for students right now, because right now distance learning is what's best. And we need the entire community to lock arms and go forward, not just for kids and teachers and staff to be safe and healthy, but also to maximize the potential of what the new year brings, which is potential for curiosity, engagement, enthusiasm, and learning across all the grade levels. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Ford, that was beautiful. Any other comments or, or correspondence that board members wanna share with the community? Well, I'll uh, share um, and I'll get to you, Dr. Reed. Um, I, I, I talked to a lot of parents um, as a parent, but this past uh, couple of weeks, I've mostly been speaking with teachers who are excited and have questions and principals about the new school year. And I just want to thank them and, and share just the, um, I mean, there's a high level of anxiety about what this will be, but so much commitment and um, a desire to really get this right for our students. And I just wanted to share that. I've had long, lengthy conversations with, with teachers who are hearing from a lot of parents and also talking amongst themselves, doing a lot of research themselves. And now, uh, thanks to, to this um, distance learning playbook that was distributed to each and every one of them. And I 
uh, it's available um, to any parent who wants it as well. Um, they're, you know, they're diving in. I just wanted to convey that there's a lot of diving in happening right now and a lot of, again, anxiety. This is challenging. This is career changing uh, for them and it's clear, but um, so, much, so much dedication to doing the best for our students. So I feel it and wanted to share that with the community. Thanks to the teachers. Okay, Dr. Reed. Just to tag on to um, the two messages already stated that were very well spoken, just to say um, again, thank you for um, our new superintendent, uh, Ms. Maldonado, because I, I really appreciate your transparency and communication that you're bringing forward, uh, not only to the board and administration, but to our community. And um, I believe that that has been really um, well received and welcomed. And um, the ongoing um, ways that you're providing us information, um, I look forward to continuing and um, appreciate that. I also want to acknowledge and very much so the, the cabinet. I mean, here we are, all the work uh, that you have done getting us to this point. And um, it has been a challenge, I know, but what I've also really been inspired by is the exciting, nimble, challenging ways of moving around and making new decisions and being very flexible and open to change. And I think that that's what we have to be, but it's been very apparent. And, um, and then that transitions into really our parents and our community and, I, um, and our teachers. I've had, as, as our other board members have mentioned, a lot of communication with teachers and parents what I've really ap appreciated is kind of what Ms. Maldonado brought forward today with this video, is, is hearing about the exciting, amazing work that teachers are prepping and planning right as we speak and have been doing to prepare for this launch into remote learning. And um, it's very clear to me that there are excited teachers out there that are challenging themselves in new ways and taking up the professional development that's being offered and really just taking it to the next level. And um, I, I, I want to acknowledge that and I, I appreciate the emails and the sharing. Uh, it makes, it warms my heart to, to see what you're doing. I want to know about it and it gets me excited and it allows me to share that with other teachers and parents. So keep sharing your great stories and your innovative stories. And finally, to the parents, um, thank you for you know being you know there to support your your students, but also in this future and this new school year to support your teachers in this new um, this new normal. And uh, so I just appreciate the support that you have shared with me, but your concerns as well. And I think as long as we have an ongoing communication between your teachers um, and your students. Uh, we can continue and start to build very, very strong relationships, even though it's remote, it's the creative way that we can start to forge relationships with each other. And I look forward to hearing, actually, this is my point out to the community, I wanna hear about creative ways teachers and students are formulating relationships in the classroom. And I think that would be great to hear across district, the whole district, so that we could get highlights and we could highlight these perhaps at different more board meetings of you know synergistic relationships that are formulating. So uh, I, I put that out there as a as a, a quest to get responses from you all. But just enjoy it. Welcome the new day, the new school day. And though it's going to be different, it, I look forward to. It's starting and us moving forward as a district with all of our families. So good luck on that first day for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I also want to um, express appreciation to our superintendent, to Hilda, communicating um, with the community, getting out there, and, um, and also continuing communication with everyone. Um, and all the hard work on behalf of the cabinet, you know, thank you so much. I know that there's a lot of thought, a uh, lot of dedication and interest put into how students are going to go back to school and continue with their learning. 
Um, and I also, you know, I don't want to repeat what my fellow board members um, have said, but also very excited about, you know, this new way, um, this, what we're doing this year in terms of, you know, in spite of COVID, COVID making learning accessible to all of our students, um, regardless of, you know, of their means, we're going to go ahead and, and do this the best we can and keep learning along the way. So I also, I enjoy, you know, learning from the emails, from the communication, from parents, uh, from students themselves and just keeping this dialogue open. Okay, thank you, Ms. Munoz. Uh, with that, oh, uh, Ms. Sims Moten wants to also weigh in here. Well, uh, <laughs> I want to weigh in. I don't know what y'all said. I hope it was good and inspiring because <laughs> I just, just got in uh, with regards to it. It sounds like he was talking about the first day of school and all the preparation that's going into that. So I certainly want to, to echo that and to thank you all for the hard work um, that you're doing, that you'll continue to do as we get to more toward, as we get toward where we really want to be. And that certainly is uh, in person. And we know that it's going to work hard work. It's going to be create, it take creativity. It's going to take patience. And it's certainly going to take perseverance for us to get where we need to do. So that we're all in this together to continue working toward that goal, including all of our students and our needs and our teachers and administrators. And so we just continue to work toward that goal. And I just appreciate being a part of this process and knowing that we're gonna get where, where we need to go. And so I don't wanna echo, but I know there were great sentiments from our board members. So that concludes, <laughs> concludes my comments. Allow, thank you for allowing me to speak on that. Thanks. You bet. Okay, with that, uh, we will move on to public comment. Mr. Hio, I believe we have uh, several members of the public with, who would like to speak about non-agenda items. So that's item C7. Thank you, President Caps. Good evening, members of the board. We have uh, four um, public comment for tonight for, on this item. I'll name them. El Elrod McLean, Roseanne Crawford, Moni Duet, and Alma Flores. I'll start with uh, Mr. McLean. Are you able to hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Sandra, for getting me on here. And um, thank you, member of the board, for granting me the opportunity to uh, speak and address you. Uh, so I'd like to start off by defining what education means. Education is a means to impart knowledge. And being a part of the board of education here in the Santa Barbara District, uh, the role is to impart knowledge to the children within the district. So that title can be the measuring rod and the purpose of what you are required to do. But uh, as is common with human nature, uh, you've kind of hid your failures and broadcast your success. So I think being in this meeting, it's time to bring those failures to light as would be appropriate in every board meeting. So especially, since our children's futures are at stake. So I'm gonna list some of the failures. It's not exhaustive, but I'm just gonna list some of the worst ones here. So firstly, I would say the board has not promoted critical thinking. It's closed the GATE program, which allowed for free thinking and critical thinking among our students in the district. Second, weapon-related violence has increased 4% since 2015. Thirdly, in the SB Unified District, 46% of our students are functionally illiterate. 55% are unable to proficiently compute in math. Fourthly, the majority of our student body, the Latino students, uh, out of that majority there, 60% are functionally illiterate. 71% of our Latino students are unable to proficiently do math computations. So in regards to this, I'm going to take a side note here, in regards to that, how can we say that's equitable education to the majority and our well, to the majority of our students, those Hispanic students, when they can't barely read and they cannot computate, the majority of them cannot do that. So from that list, it seems like the board has failed the teachers. It seems like we've failed the parents and ultimately you failed the students whom you have sworn to educate. So with this measuring rod, 
it seems that you have been found lacking. And this election season, I would say, is the day of reckoning. And because of the lack of attentiveness, transparency, and the failure to educate our children, many parents have asked me to represent them and to run for a board seat and to give them a voice for them and their children. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next we have Roseanne Crawford. Roseanne, can you hear us? Thank you, Roseanne Crawford here. Can you hear me? Yes, go Great. ahead. Thank you. In this time of questioning, I'm hopeful that the new direction with everyone pulling together will be a good one. This board, however, has failed to influence the outcome of our English learners in achieving academic progress in a uniform way. With the upcoming election, the community has identified new challengers to advocate for children over politics. Both Franklin and Adelante have a similar percentage of English learners and socioeconomic backgrounds. Franklin School is doing an outstanding job with English proficiency at 57 percentile and math at 49 percentile. Adelante is doing very poorly at 19 percentile for English and 27th percentile in math. Harding is doing better with its UCSB affiliation. What is Franklin doing to get these results? This is what is needed at all schools for all students, not the ideological concept meta. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. Thank you. Next we have Moni Duet. Moni, are you, can you hear us? Hi there, Sandra? Hi, yes, you can go ahead. And hi, board. Uh, thank you again for an opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, you know, I, I am running, but what I'm considering here is that um, I don't know if the board and the community is aware of how many barriers there are to run to be a board member. And I'm wondering if we could throw out the concept of having seven instead of five and that our board actually support a low income person maybe a parent of a high risk who actually gets a salary. And then the second position would be a student. Because I think to tell you the truth, our board, like I tried to get endorsed by the Dems and I went through this process and you know, I'm dyslexic. It took me like a full court press to finish their interview thing. It was like two days. And in the end they said, no, um, we don't want any change. And I kind of wish they would have told me that in the beginning. So. I think this shouldn't be about politics, but about the needs. So if we had more people showing up, you would be focused on the needs of those that are affected the most, which are those with learning disabilities, the homeless and the English language learners. And like, if we just got rid of Lucy Calkins, we'd be so far down the road. So I would like you to open up, you know, because you guys, in a way, it's getting a little pretentious. Most of the people running have like publicity people. This is not a level playing field. And that fee, $5,300. I mean, I asked other board members and the election, they all say that was a choice our district leadership made. And that is not, it. like I pulled it off, but I'm not, we, we need to have representation from people who can't get that paywall. And I'm not sure you guys really get that. So could you guys just, you know, chat about that behind closed doors and, and make it less exclusive? And I thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Alma Flores. Alma, can you hear us? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi everyone, my name is Alma Flores and uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, my public comment is going to be in Spanish. Um, mi nombre es Alma Flores y aunque trabajo para el Distrito Escolar de Santa Bárbara, estoy aquí como miembro de PFLAG Santa Bárbara. PFLAG Santa Bárbara es una, es una organización no lucrativa que ofrece información, recursos y apoyos a familias, amigos y aliados de personas LGBTQ. 
Por desgracia, aunque los valores de la cultura latina priorizan la familia y el amor incondicional, aún existen prejuicios y mitos en contra de, en contra de hijos y familiares LGBTQ. Eh, no sé si sepan que el 40% de los, 40 de los jóvenes LGBTQ no son aceptados por sus familias. Uh, y aún existen casos en que los padres echan a sus hijos cuando se enteran de su identidad de género o, se, o, o de su orientas, orientación sexual. En otros casos, hay hijos que terminan huyendo de sus, de sus hogares por el rechazo y el, y el acoso familiar y en, en casos peores uh, han llegado hasta el suicidio. Eh, el 13 de agosto, eh, este jueves que viene, Kiflag Santa Bárbara ofrecerá por primera vez una reunión de apoyo en español con interpretación a inglés. Eh, la reunión será a las 7 de la noche y el propósito de la reunión es, es ofrecer un lugar, es un lugar seguro en nuestro idioma natal para compartir y escuchar relatos de familiares, amigos y aliados de personas que se identifican como LGBTQ. En la reunión habrá la oportunidad de conocer y crear amistades con personas con experiencias similares que hablan español. La meta de PFLAG es crear un lugar, un lugar espacio seguro y confidencial donde nuestras familias latinas puedan acudir para apoyo e información en español para que ellos a la vez puedan brindar apoyo a sus, a sus hijas, hijos, hijes. Este, eh, les pido que por favor compartan esta información. Eh, se pueden registrar en el sitio web de pflagsantabarbara.org. Haga clic en español o puede llamar a la línea de apoyo en español. El número de teléfono es el área 805. 724-2179. And uh, this meeting will be in Spanish with interpretation into English. Um, please show your support for our Latinx families and show up. Again, it's August 13th, this coming Thursday at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. President Capps, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Hugh, and thank you to the members of the public. Okay, with that, uh, the item that I already introduced, but now it's actually time for it, it's um, our action agenda, and we need to address uh, items. Well, first we can um, address item D, A, which is the acceptance of donations, and I need a motion, please. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Seconded by Ms. Sims-Moten. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Accepted with gratitude. And now it's time for the consent agenda. I, any um, board members wish, I believe we actually have some public comment on um, items E3, E4, and E5. Uh, Mr. Hio. Yes, and we have um, Sheridan Rosenberg. Ms. Rosenberg, would you would you mind combining your comments? No, I intended to. Thank you. I, thank you. So uh, thank you. Um, I, I guess what I want to really start with is that these two agenda items that total over a million dollars to these NGOs just jumps right out at all of us, especially during a time when you're underwater, almost 10 million. Um, this really appears to be outsourcing. I'm not sure why we're outsourcing to these NGOs for mental health services and why we aren't reaching out to the county to provide those services or perhaps even encouraging these NGOs to work with the county and simply use um, these as sources for referrals so that we can refer students and teachers to them. But we're literally underwriting them, we're funding them. And, and furthermore, I'm very troubled by two things. Why aren't we, if, if, there, if we need to hire counselors, and I'm certainly supportive of mental health services, um, why aren't we bringing them in-house? It seems like a double standard. I mean, you passed a policy with, for example, at what came out of the Mad Academy, which was a sound policy, no fraternizing, and that no employee of the Mad Academy would be an employee 
of a nonprofit or a third party provider, they would be employees by the district. And that makes sense because there's oversight and you're in compliance with FERPA. And for a whole constellation of reasons, which is you have authority over that person. But when I think about mental health care services, the one thing I find really troubling is the potential for a lack of continuity of care. Kids come through our district K through 13, um, or K through 12, but it's 13 years, presumably. And if you have staff people that could perhaps follow those students all the way through versus a transient sort of staff of people through these NGOs, it's completely inappropriate. Not only that, this is a very high ticket item. Why didn't it go out for public bidding? You know, which is not only, it's, it's state and federal law, it's your own policy. These are not necessarily, these don't necessarily qualify as special services. But, you know, I, I also find it troubling that these very high contracts are coming in bundled at once tonight, not long before November. And it makes me wonder if you didn't sort of make promises to these organizations. We live in a small town, everybody knows everybody. And it looks as if these seconds. are looking to the district to underwrite them to support their employees. And I think that this really is a glaring lack of transparency and really inappropriate. And parents are scrambling right now. The pod courses are, are all the rage. People are talking about it. I think they've faith in the district. And if they can get their kids out any way they're going to, and that this is a really bad time to be uh, spending this kind of money. Thank you. Thank you. Um, President Capps, that concludes public comment on this item. Any board, thank you so much. Any board members want, would like to pull any consent agenda items? Dr. Reed. Uh, well, actually, I was going to pull that item, three and four. Great. Me too. Uh, Go, great. So if I could, can I speak to that? Yeah, so the first one, E3? Yeah. Um, right. I want to speak to both of them, so I'll just sort of bundle them together. I actually want to acknowledge um, the mental health program that we have, uh, the work that has been done by Dr. Wagonet to frame our mental health framework has created a very strong program that's only growing and only becoming more sustainable <clears throat> because of the need that we need to do. And I think especially at this time, we need to be aware of um, the mental health of our teachers and our students. So I'm actually um, calling attention to it because I think it's an important aspect of what we do as a district. And I think we need to be cognizant of the mental health currently as we go into this new school year. And um, I believe the work that CALM and the Family Service Agency has been doing has been tremendous support to our district. And so I want to um, acknowledge that. And I know we've had numerous reports. There's been a lot of transparency about what has been brought forward around the mental health framework and how we got to this place. And so I would um, recommend for those who don't have that information that it is accessible on our board um, meetings. And um, you, can, you can read back and, and see how the transformation of our mental health framework took place. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Reed. Ms. Ford. Uh, I didn't want to comment on, on those two. I wanted to comment on uh, E8. OK, uh, well, thank you. We'll get to that in a second. I also wanted to. A comment on items E3 and E4 and talk about our mental health services, which are at, at utmost necessity right now. This is a multi-year plan. And so perhaps members of the public don't understand that we actually went through quite um, a bidding process and transparency process in terms of uh, ensuring which partners we're actually going to work with. Believe me, is it Dr. Wagnick, are we in the second or third year of this uh, mental health program? We are heading into our third year with CALM and our three, four year because we piloted on a uh, smaller scale the first year. Uh, Great. So really year four with FSA. Thank you. And I, um, I can see that, uh, you know, an item this big 
if it was the first time we were talking about it, um, shouldn't be on the consent agenda. But the reason why I can say this as board president, it's on the consent agenda is because we are actually in year th three slash four of a program that's been quite successful. It's some, one of the most, the, the proudest achievements I uh, have of this district in the last few years is our strong emphasis on mental health and working with such strong partners like Calm and family service agencies. And uh, the way in which the community has been allowed to understand it, the Independent did a, a big story on it just recently. So there's been a lot of attention necessarily because we, if you might remember a few years back, um, I mean, suicide is always on our mind and a, a threat to our students, but we had quite a few uh, in a cluster uh, a couple years back and this program has proved to be so important to students, to teachers, to staff, to parents, to families. I had the opportunity as a parent to go in and watch, um, as all parents were allowed to do, uh, to observe a calm uh, therapist working in my son's classroom. And I learned as a mom how to talk to him uh, uh, more fluidly about his feelings. So just wanted to give a little background and encourage anybody to read The Independent. As Dr. Reed said, a lot of the materials about our mental health program are, can be found on our website. And it's something I think is, was necessary for the school district. And now given the pandemic and our focus on the social and emotional learning of our students remotely is all the more important. So I'm glad to be moving forward on these two agenda items. Uh, Ms. Sims Moten, did you have a question or comment on these? Yes, I do. So just to add to what both uh, President Capps and Dr. Reed had said with regards to as we were working out this very transparent, long-standing process, we were also being, putting into a very strong evaluation component of these programs that weren't there initially. And so I, again, that's the transparency, but we want to make sure that these programs are accountable to what we are, what we're seeking from them and the services that they're providing uh, to our students and our teachers in, in our district. So I wanted to add that that was part of the, the process of even starting to even get to the, getting to these particular uh, um, providers, that that was really a, a number one importance for us to make sure there was a strong evaluation component. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. That's an, a really important point that this board in recent years has made a priority over every program, especially those that we will partner with, with an outside uh, nonprofit or educational institution. We've implemented an evaluation process to make sure that the taxpayer money as has been brought up is well spent. So thanks for that, Ms. sims Moten. Uh, Ms. Munoz. Yes, I always, I also wanted to, you know, echo the um, concerns that my board members have voiced in terms of transparency and the services that are provided. Um, when I, as a member of the community, I attended uh, board meetings with Dr. Wagenek presenting, you know, what the plan was with the um, comm staff and FSA staff also presenting um, what their program would be and how it would be evaluated. So I know that it's been transparent, you know, from day one. So I appreciate, you know, um, also sharing that with the community so that they're aware of, of how this came about. Um, Thank you, Ms. Munoz. Uh, other comments or questions on the items that we're now addressing E3 and E4? I know Kate has, Ms. Ford has one on E8. Okay, moving to uh, E8, Ms. Ford. Thanks. I don't want to pull this item, but I just did want to point out to uh, the public who is graciously tuned in today that on our uh, HR report, there were two teachers who retired in the month of July. Well, actually one in July and one on August 1st. And the first one, Lisa Kuhn, had 40 years of service to Santa Barbara Unified. And the second, Susan Park, had 33 years of service to Santa Barbara Unified. This is amazing, and I wish them well. Wonderful. Thank you for making that note. That's important, <laughs> important for us to acknowledge their service. Okay, with that, uh, I know that Ms. Sims Moten, you had one that you actually wanted to pull, not just comment about, but pull. Uh, yes, and one comment on just the item that uh, Ms. Ford just said, I had also noticed on our food service worker that it was a promotion from within. So it's always important as we're promoting our employees that are here that are working hard that now have been promoted. So I wanted to highlight that as well. Um, and congratulations on that. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge on E12 happily that I need to abstain from that because of course it's coming from first five. And so I will probably have to pull that separate 
separately so we can call a roll call on that so that I can be on record uh, as abstaining for that. But glad to see that going forth because you know how the importance of early care to me. And so the fact that we're getting that ball rolling is really, really good. So I will um, go on officially record to abstain when you call for that particular item. Excellent. So unless there's other questions on consent agenda items, we will uh, pull that item that Ms. Sims Moten just mentioned and we will vote on the rest. Um, that would be items E1 through 11 and E uh, uh, and also E13 through 21. Uh, so if I can have a motion on those items minus um, E12. So moved. Dr. Reed, second by Ms. Ford. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Motion carries. Uh, a vote please on item E12, consent agenda item E12. So moved. Dr. Reed, thank you. Ms. Ms. Mignot says a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Abstain. So we have the vote four and one abstention to be noted. Okay, thank you for that with the uh, consent agenda. Now moving on to action agenda. Um, Dr. Reed, the preview that I gave you at the start here. F1, please. Thank you. Uh, I move to approve board action on student transfer case number 2019-201-05. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving on to the next one, action agenda item two. I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 2020 slash 2021 school year education code 46600. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on to action agenda item three. I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 2020 slash 2021 school year education code 46600. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to action agenda number four. I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 2020 slash 2021 school year education code 446600. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving forward to action agenda item five, I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 20 2020 slash 2021 school year education code 446600 and 2021-T13. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You know, I'm, I'm realizing I'm missing some of these numbers because I, so do I need to repeat any of those? Um, I'm missing some of the case numbers in my reporting out. Do I need to repeat those? I don't think you need to repeat them, uh, but okay. I, I, could I, be, I could be corrected by someone who understands. I think my, my screen was so large that I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see those additional numbers. So. Um, I am calling it out by action agenda number, so yeah, I'm going to. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. Action agenda item number six. I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 2020/2021 school year education code 46600-46611, case number 202021-T14. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and I'm sorry that my, uh, my agenda just went down. So if you give me one second. Okay, it just came up. So now I'm moving to action agenda item number seven. I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 2020. 2021 school year education code 46600-4661 case number 202021-T15. Okay, I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Moving on to the next agenda item, action agenda item, board, I move to approve board action on interdistrict transfer appeal for 2020 slash 2021 school year, education code 46600-46611, case number 202021-T16. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I hand it back to you, President Caps. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, so now we move to item E9, which is, it sounds like something we should be all be in favor of, approval of declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Dr. Becchio. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Uh, the next two items really are housekeeping items around credentialing. And um, the first one is the declaration of need, which um, really is something annually, annually that we file. Uh, with the CTC, um, it does require board action and, and basically we're estimating what our needs may be um, to uh, hiring teachers that aren't yet fully credentialed. So this happens uh, from time to time. Um, for example, if someone moves in from out of state, uh, while they're getting their credentials settled here in California, we would need to, um, need to employ them, our, our um, internship credentials, things like that. So this is something that uh, there's a resolution 2021-05 and um, your action tonight will, um, once, once approved, we would send that to the CTC. Thank you, Dr. Becchio. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, thank you. So we need a motion. So moved. Dr. Reed, and I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Dr. Becchio, uh, item E10. All right, thank you very much. And this is a um, provisional internship permit request. Again, um, brought these to you before, and the um, Commission on Teacher Credentialing requires board action so we can file for the provisional internship. The two teachers uh, represented here are both uh, in the special education department. Uh, they're both enrolled in a program and applying for the provisional internship permit. And so uh, this um, really requires your action. And then we will again file this with Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Thank you. Any questions from the board? OK. Uh, we need a motion. So moved. Thank Thank you. Board. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, item e uh, 11, uh, F11. I believe we have, Mr. Hill, we have a public speaker. Yes, we do. We have one public comment for this item is um, Roseanne Crawford. So this is item 11, which is approval of 2020. 21 consolidated application for categorical funding for the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Thank you, Roseanne here. As a taxpayer, I like to see federal funding spent from categorical funding where it's most needed and most effective. It has been a disappointment over the years to see the lack of progress with the exception of several outlayer schools in achieving the goal of grade level and graduation standards. There is a disconnect with accountability. <clears throat> I hope there can be implementation of tracking and transparency of the areas of distribution of these awards to measure degrees of success in promoting effective programs and support for English learners, not just throwing darts at a board with concepts such as META. Please don't use our students as experiments. Look at what's working and promote that success. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item, Ms. Camps. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Thank you, Board President Caps and other members of the board. Um, I'm bringing to you our consolidated application that is uh, required by the state of California in order for us to access those federal funds that we often refer to as Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV funds. Um, this actually is a product um, of a joint effort, a multi-department effort. You might glean that from seeing whose names are included. Um, 
And you can see the various attachments there that speak to different aspects of the federally funded programs. I think given the narrative and the attachments, I'll make myself available for any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Any questions from the board? Just, sorry, when, when it's a shared screen, I can't see my, I can't see everybody. So holler if I don't see you, <laughs> there we go. Okay, no comments or questions. So I just need a motion here. Motion. Oh. I saw Ms. Sims Moten first, and how about a second for, from Ms. Ford? Um, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Great. Okay, we are moving on to item F12, which is request for adoption of FOSS science instructional materials for grade TK through 5. I know that last meeting we didn't give this the due time that it deserves given all the work that has gone into this. So now we actually have the opportunity to um, uh, formally approve it. So I wanna just give that context for any board member who has a question or comment. Uh, we're now only at 7.38 in the evening. Um, so please, please don't hold back. <laughs> I should, I should, I'm sorry, I hear you. There's a presentation first, so that might garner uh, questions or comments. All right, thank you for that introduction, President Caps. And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Sierra Lockridge to walk us through, um, again, just the, the, the adoption recommendation. Good evening, President Caps, board members, Superintendent Maldonado, and Cabinet. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk to you about this. This is a an adoption that we are bringing with a great enthusiasm. We know that it will be a game changer for our students and uh, serve as a pathway forward for other adoptions in the future. So we're gonna be talking about FOSS Science, which is full option science system. And Brian, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, I wanna give you a little background. Um, this adoption was entered in after much consultation with our Elementary Instructional Council, as well as a pilot that lasted for quite a few years that started with um, Lawrence Hall Science uh, out of Stanford and Bayside Initiative. And we began when Common Core first came in and the Next Generation Science Standards began in 2013. Trying out these materials, we've invested a lot of professional learning and time and energy in them. And the feedback and uh, joy has been really palpable. So this um, adoption was put forward by the Elementary Instructional Council. Additional opportunities um, on the next slide show that not only did we provide um, time for our teachers to come and give public comment, we also hosted three webinars uh, to the public given that it's it's COVID and we grew the FOSS curriculum with them and answered questions that they may have had. And as you know, uh, this is our final recommendation after the 30 days of public comment. And we are really hoping that um, you will move forward with the adoption. On the next slide, please. So what is FOSS? FOSS is hands-on engaging learning. It has all the NGSS standards and hits the three um, pillars of NGSS, which are the cross-cutting concepts. So things like patterns and cause and effect, um, the engineering and scientific practices, which are the habits of mind that we want our students to have. And it also has the disciplinary core ideas that later on in science, our kids will need to thrive in high school and in college. And it's, it's just really good about cultivating critical thinking and communication. So this is a powerful tool that can be utilized in all of our elementary classrooms, TK through five. And TK will be brand new and they'll be very excited to have uh, this new curriculum as well. So it's really meant to foster a love of science. If you'll go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about the program. Um, one of the exciting features of FOSS is that they have a very robust digital presence. They have FOSS Web, and all of our kids have access to audiobooks, print books, and um, English and Spanish options. There is a parent home connection, so 
Um, Ms. Caps, all the parents out there, you're going to love doing this with your kids. It's super engaging and it walks you through hand um, step by step how you can do these experiments at home. Moreover, it has videos that actually do demonstrations. So not only do the teachers have a lot of experience in FOSS, as I mentioned, since 2013, but FOSS itself has been a very good partner with us. And they have built up a lot of resources to support um, schools and distance learning with vocabulary, home school connections, and just a lot of interactive notebooks. So the kids could actually write out what they're doing and the teacher could see real time uh, what that looks like. On the next slide kind of shows what the back page would look like for a teacher. So animals two by two, this is a, a first grade um, unit. Uh, all the first grade units are very um, developmentally appropriate. Animals two by two, uh, sound and light, all positive things that we want our kids to do because we would like them to go outside and explore the world around them and make those connections um, really explicit. This page that you're seeing now kind of shows you that not only do they all kids have access to the teacher videos, but there's teacher prep videos, there's ebooks in Spanish, there's focus questions, and there's just a lot of different materials that are both virtual and in print. Next slide, please. So I'm here to answer any questions about the FOSS science curriculum and really recommend wholeheartedly that we take this forward as an adoption and that we use this format of getting instructional counsel, opportunities for teachers to give input and the community to give input to bring forward other adoptions in the future. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the board for questions. Thank you, Ms. Lockridge. Any other questions or comments from the board? Ms. Ford. Uh, no questions. I think I mentioned before, I love FOSS and I, I thought your presentation has been awesome each time, Ms. Luffridge. So I'm very excited to support this. Thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to, let's see. Reed had I'm sorry, Reed. you got a few up. I apologize. Okay, Dr. Reed. <laughs> sorry. Like, ah! Um, I just wanted to um, also just uh, comment that Ms. Ford's comment to say yes, yes, yes to the dress of FOSS. Um, and the reasoning I'm saying also is not only with the parent home connection, but really with the connection to the outdoors and the idea of really linking our classrooms and our science to outdoors and, and nature-based education. And I know that um, Ms. Maldonado um, uh, coordinated with um, a community organizations, Wilderness Youth Project, with Explore Ecology. She's doing her due diligence to really seek out within the community the nature-based organizations that exist in our community and how we can come together. I think it's a powerful time that we can tie in the work that we are doing currently in our schools and how can we make it more robust to really find those connections and intersections between learning and outdoor education. And I think um, the quote that I just um, was really impressed with um, was, you know, that we just need to, outdoors is what will save us. And I do think we really have to think about that truly, what opportunities can we afford ourselves in the district um, to m allow for more outdoor opportunities um, and outdoor classroom act activities as we move hopefully um, back into the classroom and maybe a hybrid model. So I want to just sort of acknowledge that um, there is opportunity and also to the work that we're doing with facilities in terms of our environmental sustainability can be tied to teaching and learning and what we're doing with science, what we're doing in, in, in language arts and with nature. So I think it's a really a, a wonderful opportunity. And this really provides the sort of the launching pad for us to maybe be more purposeful in how we integrate um, outdoor learning with um, our um, academic learning. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Ms. Munoz. Yes, I also, I agree with my fellow board members. I love that it really does instill a love of science and learning. Um, the fact that it has so many different dimensions in terms of, you know, students that learn in, in different ways. 
um, English and Spanish, and also how hands-on it is for, you know, from the kindergarten grades on up. Um, I, it's exciting. I want to learn about this <laughs> stuff. So I, you know, definitely am in agreement with it. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Zoten. Yes, I'm, I'm agree with my sister board members and you know, I'm going to advocate for a preschool. How can we, you know, they love to play in dirt naturally. So how do we incorporate this in the early piece and we continue to, as a foundation, continue to moving it forward. So I'm hoping that we're also have as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is so important. Um, I think we have to, to address some of the points mentioned by the board members. We have a wonderful partnership with our community of outdoor educators. And we have been meeting with some of the ones that you mentioned, including the Wilderness Youth Project. They're in line with figuring out how to make their, their curriculum NGSS aligned and really deepen it as it does explore ecology. And the very exciting uh, new chance to, for the Harding School to be the West Side outdoor education model for futures um, is very exciting. And I know that Daisy Ochoa, our preschool coordinator, shares your love for a uh, for mm -hmm. the little guys and making sure that it's hands-on and engaging. Um, the preschool kit right now is called MESS and that's actually the, the term. Yes. And it, it's, it's a fun one. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah if I, if they, just to echo and, and connect the dots because um, uh, last uh, two Sundays ago I watched on PBS Sunday uh, this great um, segment on outdoor learning and how it could be the savior now with with the pandemic and it featured Dr. Strange at the Lawrence Hall of Science, who is behind FOSS. So it was great to, con I just want to connect that dot for the public because I posted it on my Facebook and I had about also, you know, five or six friends send me this segment um, uh, and I encourage people to read it, but it, just to connect that the same person behind this na outdoor COVID national movement is, is also behind the scenes of this curriculum. And so to the, the synergy, even though FOSS has been in the works here with Santa Barbara Unified pre-pandemic, uh, but the synergy is really an important one that I think all of our board members just spoke to, but just wanted to connect those dots for the public. Definitely. I'm Thank glad you. we're already in touch with Lawrence Hall of Science at Berkeley. Okay, uh, with that, I need a motion to approve this curriculum. Dr. Reed. That's so moved. Seconded by Ms. Munoz, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, excited. Okay, thank you so much to our educators. And now we move to um, thir item 13, um, which is similar. Uh, I can't see my agenda now, but go for it. You can continue to give the presentation. Thank you, President Cap. Speaking of synergy, there's a really important connection between the prior item and this item, as I'll let Ms. Larios Horton explain. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Um, yes, the excitement continues because um, our English language arts, English language development framework for California asks that we implement a designated English language development uh, curriculum and instruction that is aligned to what students are already learning. And so we wanted to make sure that we follow those guidelines, um, not just because they're in the framework, but because we truly believe that learning needs to be coherent and connected. And so we could not find any materials off the shelf that we felt were good enough for our Santa Barbara Unified students. So um, next slide. Our curriculum is um, developed uh, by our own educators and the UC Berkeley Hall of Science, Lawrence Hall of Science, and they have developed instructional materials that are incredible, that will continue uh, student learning in the sciences, but also reveal and teach language that is so crucial uh, to academic excellence for our students. Next slide. Once again, uh, just uh, wanting to mention that incredible partnership between the UC Berkeley Hall of Science um, and our own educators. So the units were designed uh, with the guidance, of, again, of the English Language Arts, English Language Development Framework. They're aligned to the designated English or the English Language Development Standards. 
And the team was just absolutely incredible because they developed lessons for each level of language proficiency. So um, next slide. You can see here an example of how that instruction is differentiated by English language proficiency level, which is required um, of our district and all districts uh, when implementing designated English language development. Next slide. We followed a very similar public or an exactly the same uh, public review timeline um, as the FOSS science. And so we've received uh, some really great input and feedback, but most of all, support uh, for these instructional materials. Next slide. And now I'm available for questions or comments and looking for, again, a recommendation for adoption of these amazing ELD instructional materials. If adopted, they would be the first designated English language development materials um, formally adopted since the, the adoption of the ed English language development standards for this, the California Department of Education. So with that, I'll open to questions. Thanks for that presentation and that context, very helpful. Questions or comments? Again, I, it's hard to see my old, uh, so holler, uh, if you don't mind unsharing the screen, that, thank you. Okay, Dr. Reed. Yes, I just wanted to thank um, you, Ms. Lourdes Horton, for, um, for bringing this forward. And I think just for, this is a big step, right? This is a new, a new step of really engaging um, in a way that frames the meta way that your professional development that you're doing. I, um, I appreciated your email actually earlier today talking about um, the work that you're doing, the professional development that you're doing, and that the teachers are really resonating with this um, framework and the meta training around, and, and perhaps this will be another option opportunity. But uh, I wonder if you could just speak to that for a brief minute about um, the responses you're getting in terms of the professional development around META. Absolutely, I was hoping to share that during our COVID report, um, but I can just briefly share uh, that absolutely positive feedback around our, our launch of the META initiative, um, as well as the very specific designated ELD modules at the elementary that are connected to FOSS. Um, and so just, again, teachers are feeling uh, and, and um, sharing that the materials are uh, exactly what they have been hoping for. And we are going to make sure that our teachers receive the support that they need for implementation as well. But um, so far, a lot of very positive comments and we're just really excited for this as even though we're going to be in, dis in distance learning, there's a lot of excitement around the content and the manner in which we'll be delivering um, some of this instruction. So just, again, a lot of positive. Thank you. I just think it's important to share the positive synergy that's coming around these new, this new work and the, and the new framework and, and the new curriculum. So thank you. Ms. Munoz. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Larios Horton, I really appreciate, you know, the quality of the um, ELD um, program, you know, programming and, um, and just, you know, thank you so much. I, I know how much work you put into this and I appreciate that. Okay, Ms. sims -Wilton. Hi, and I forgot to ask this to you, Sierra, and also to Marty uh, Lourdes. Um, I just want to know, can you guys share what the public input was response to that? I know we had three different times that they were able to, to come in, so it's important to always hear what they're thinking about this. I know we're excited about it, but what were some of the feedback from parents or others who reviewed the, the curriculums? I think that um, the, the, the families that were able to, to engage with us via a webinar had excellent questions. Um, and we were able to answer those questions uh, in, the, uh, in the, the live webinar. I think I could speak specifically to the designated ELD piece. There were questions around um, how might this be delivered through a distance learning model, um, questions around how um, uh, 
uh, what, you know, how long and how um, often does the designated English language development um, instruction need to be? Uh, and of course, we were able to answer those questions. Um, those were the those were the main questions for our my the designated ELD curriculum. So there that, there wasn't a whole lot of input. There was just a lot of positive, and then those those two questions alone for a designated ELD. Yeah, and I would add for um, science, it was uh, people were pleased to see that it had the life science, the earth science components, um, and when we did the webinar, we had. Uh, you know, the, our science consultant, Holly Gill, and Hortensia Corral, who's now the new AP at, at Roosevelt and uh, Adams, but um, speak to it. And they really like the interconnection between the, the science and the, the English language development piece, because learning a new learning English language should come from and to content. And what better content than science? All kids are naturally curious. Um, I think the part that probably stood out was we previewed some of the what the books looked like on the inside, what the web page looked like, what the resources the teachers had, um, and it was it was it was positive feedback. And then from the teacher community, uh, they have been using it for a long time and they're ready to go with it. Um, we will definitely, to Maria's point, support them with the designated ELD but I think this will just make all of our program stronger. Our kids will have access and an opportunity to, to have co-experiences and to create language around that and just be able to articulate all their curiosity and hypotheses. And I think it's going to be a win-win. And I know that FOSS is very thankful to have the partnership as we are with them and we're all learning together. I appreciate that, and I, you know, just you know, for the public that we do a, a well-rounded, you know, uh, review of it. Were there any concerns that you guys had to address, or do you, or did you know, you anticipated in terms of that? I did not get any concerns. People logged in and they checked it out, and then once they felt satisfied, um, you know, they moved on. Right. I think the only concerns I think that we we um, receive were mostly on on the part of, of teachers. Will they receive the support uh, for implementation? Uh, and of course, we we have high expectations, but we also must couple them with high levels of support. So uh, we just recently, um, because of the departure of our amazing Hortensia Corral, we've just recently hired a new uh, teacher on assignment who will help with implementation across our district, but we know that more help is needed. So we're going to figure out how to make sure that our teachers feel supported um, throughout the school year in this initial year of implementation. I would just add one other thing, our NGSS leadership team, which is composed of teachers um, elected by their peers, a primary and lower, um, have been working with our science consultant on this. They're, they're also going to be available to help support. And we're starting the units with an outdoor emphasis because it makes the most sense to all of your points uh, in previous meetings and correspondence. Well, thank you both for your comments. All right. Thank you to the team and to the board. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we need a motion on this item. Ms. Ford. So moved. Ms. Sims Moten with a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Enthusiastic yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion carries. Thanks to the team. That wraps up our action agenda. We are going to take a quick break here at um, 8.01. Let's, let's give ourselves nine minutes, come back at 8.10, um, and we'll move then into the report and discussion agenda. So take a quick break. Thanks, everybody. Okay, let's see. Uh, thank you, Brian, if you could. There we go. Uh, I can see everybody once again, and thanks to the members of the, of the public who are hanging in there with us tonight. It's only eight o'clock. Uh, seems quite early to be moving on to our report agenda, which is uh, two items tonight. We have first is item G1, which is report on the learning continuity and attendance plan requirements and timeline which is Ms. Carey and Ms. Guermo Guan. Dr. Guermo Guan. So I will turn it over to you both. 
Thank you again, uh, Board President Caps, And I'm gonna turn it straight away to Dr. Guillermo Juan, uh, who's our point person uh, on this project. Good evening, President Caps, Board, Superintendent Maldonado, Cabinet and Public. I'm here to provide a report on a new state required plan called the Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan. At its core, this plan is, tended, is intended to be a high level document that combines all the plans that we have been developing for the 2020-2021 school year, and which will be discussed in more detail in the next agenda item. In this way, this rep report provides an overview of the new state requirements that overlay the work that we have already been doing and is underway. Next slide, please. So first, I would like to provide a brief overview before highlighting the components of the plan. Senate Bill 98 was pa um, not passed. It was signed into law on June 29th of 2020, and it replaces the prior governor's executive order that had required a one-year LCAP for 2021 to be developed by December 15th of this year. It's important to note, however, that the budget overview for parents that details the use of supplemental funds is still required to be approved by the local board of education by December 15th of this year. SB 98 establishes a new learning continuity and attendance plan, which has the same acronym as LCAP, but it is not the LCAP. And so we will be referring to it as the continuity plan. And it's uh, aimed at uh, the, a plan for launching school under pandemic conditions. Importantly, there are also new additional one-time funds nearing $11 million, which again will be addressed in the following board report. And this is to um, help launch school successfully under pandemic conditions. So again, the purpose of, of the continuity plan really is to summarize the stakeholder engagement and planning that we have already been doing and will continue to do as we plan for reopening school and to make explicit the actions and expenditures necessary to implement, implement the plan, regardless of funding source. So in this way, it's very different from the LCAP. The requirements for stakeholder engagement, however, are very similar to the LCAP. Uh, in addition, SB 98 requires that we seek input from families who speak a language other than English or who do not have access to the internet. And the state has really emphasized in their rollout of this plan to school districts and county offices of education that the input from these families be at the heart of the plan to ensure we meet the needs of our foster youth, emergent multilingual students, and students from low income households in particular. Finally, this plan must be approved on or before September 30th, 2020. Next slide, please. So here we have the continuity plan components. It opens with general information about our district and then a description of the stakeholder engagement that we have been doing and will continue to do throughout August and September. And then the heart of the, the plan is really around this concept of continuity of learning, whether it be in person or in a distance learning model or, or hybrid. And then we also need to address um, what the state is calling pupil learning loss, um, meaning if students uh, were not able to master particular um, sections of the curriculum content skills during the emergency uh, teaching in the spring, how we will accelerate their learning to um, ensure that they are, are at grade level this entire year. Then there's a section on um, student and family engagement and outreach, how we are going to be communicating with our families, school nutrition, and then, um, oops, and I missed, I'm sorry, very important not to miss at the bottom of the slide, and we've talked about it earlier already um, this evening, is, is a section on mental health and social emotional well-being. And then last but not least, um, similar to the LCAP, a requirement for increased and improved services for foster youth, emergent multilingual students, and low income students. So some good news again is that we've already been working on each of these areas over several months and have had informal and formal stakeholder engagement that's already influenced the plans we are developing in these areas. So I, again, I invite you to think about the state required plan as a high level document that points to all the planning and work that have been done and, and continue to be done. 
around providing a rigorous distance learning program, at least to start. But it will also address if we're able to shift into um, in person, what, what, um, what we will be doing in that scenario. Next slide, please. So because we are um, starting in a distance learning model, I wanted to make sure that I highlight plan sections within that so that um, the board and public can see the particulars that must be addressed. And you'll notice that uh, many of these are topics that have been um, reported on and will be reported on in the next agenda item and are very important and are, are matters that our community have raised to us. So next slide, please. Um, and lastly, here's uh, our timeline. So again, the Senate bill was signed into law at the end of June. In July, we had an opportunity to um, hold focus groups with primi primarily Spanish dominant, uh, Spanish dominant families who were able to provide input around reopening school. And we also had our union negotiations and um, both of these really helped shape shape the plans that um, have been coming to you thus far, even before we had um, information, really clear information from the state about what the requirements were. And then actually open now um, through August 20th, we have a stakeholder input survey. So we invite our families and the general public to um, click on the links that are in the attachments for this board agenda and you can provide your input um, with regard to reopening school. And we will be sending messaging out um, to staff and, and families later this week around this opportunity. Importantly, similar to the LCAP, we get to meet with our DLAC and our LCAP Parent Advisory Committee. Um, we're going to do this two, uh, twice. Um, the first meetings will be an overview, similar to this, this report, but an overview of the process and um, a more facilitated um, receipt of input and dialogue around students' needs and the student groups that the state has asked us to focus on. And then the second meetings will, um, we are required to take to both of these committees a draft of the plan. And that is all required to happen prior to a public hearing, which will be, um, our plan is to have that September 8th, and then board adoption September 22nd. Um, and that, that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time. Thank you, Dr. Guillermo Juan. Any questions from the board? Oops, I can't, let's see. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Reed. Thank you, President Capps. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge this and sort of see how it can be tied into these new learning pods that we're hearing about in terms of um, supporting ELD and special needs students. And certainly we know in our own community where we have parents um, gathering together, creating pods for our uh, GATE students. So it, I think it's really a way of reimagining our remote learning. And I'm kind of under, wanting to understand if there's funding here to support this sort of, um, new sort of adaptation to remote learning with these pods? Um, is that something that is being considered in, as part of this process in terms of really focusing in and, and doing a deep dive with what we can do strategizing wise with pods? Um, I'm not able to speak directly to the question about pods, but what I can highlight is what the state is um, requiring districts to do is to um, make sure that we are outreaching and engaging and gaining, gathering input from our families of emergent multilingual foster youth and low income students, and that our plan should really be reflecting the needs of those students and communities. So um, um, that's, what I, that's what I'm able to um, offer, and I would invite my colleagues um, who might be able to speak more specifically to that question. Yeah, I'll jump in and say that um, there's a range of, of different things that are being referred to as pods. And what I see the continuity plan uh, being focused on is how to make our first instruction the best instruction possible for all students and particularly for those students um, who are deserving of the additional supports that we, we want to bring to them, those students with disabilities and students who are emergent multilingual students. 
Yeah, I just think that parents can be such incredible partners in remote learning. And so to really formulate a real connection with that um, and just seeing what I've been reading, uh, a lot of articles about different districts across the country really utilizing that connection. Parents wanting to get engaged, wanting to get involved, wanting to support their children and how we, we might facilitate that in a really um, a proactive way to support um, and I know this is sp focused specifically on ELD and, um, and our special needs students, students with disabilities. So I think that's really important. I just think we need to look at for all students too and really ensure that we're supporting them all. But um, I, will, I look forward to learning more about what comes out of these meetings and what parents are seeking, because I think we need to be really reflective of that and really um, making sure that we're, we're meeting those needs of our students and our parents have really the inside scoop to that first and foremost. Ms. Wilton. Hi, thank you. So thank you for this presentation. So I, I have a question specifically regarding your outreach plans that often the underrepresented students don't get the outreach plan is not there though, so the parents don't get engaged so i'm wondering can you share beyond the, the, the spanish dominant groups we have those smaller underrepresented groups of, of, of students and a community how are you outreaching did you outreach and if not when are you going to outreach um thank you for the question um we have just um been speaking about this um that very thing today and um within the last week or so and so we have not yet conducted that outreach, but we're developing um, our plans and identifying um, families to outreach to, um, to ensure that we can bring in additional voices. And I know that you know previously you've um, specifically asked around um, families of students who are Black, African American, and Asian American. And so I just wanted to state that that is um, something that we are looking into and um, are planning to do um, with regard to inviting um, families to participate in our LCAP Parent Advisory Committee. So here's my concern with that. I, this is often, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And, and I know that impossible, I mean, it may be difficult, but it's not impossible, but this is, it seems to be we're going to, do, we're going to reach out. And this, this continues to be a trend here. And that concerns me that when we, when we meet to outreach, we've talked about it, we know about it, but yet the answer is we're going to do it. So when you come in already with a plan that said we've done this outreach to this larger group, get it, definitely get that. But it cannot continue to be, we're going to get it. It needs to be a part of, we've done that too, because we know that that's something that we've been asked to do. We know it's something that's necessary to do. And so we need to continue to, I want to see, I don't want to see, keep seeing a trend of we're going to do it. I want to see it when you come to a plan, knowing that this is part of our district. It's not different. It's not new. So what are we going to do? I would really like to see in these plans coming up here, these underrepresented students that have been saying for three years, we're going to do, what is it that, what is it going to take to, to have it be part of a plan that's presented in the beginning, not after? Yes, I hear you, I hear your, um, yes, thank you. Your comment is very welcome and, um, and has support um, within our staff. So I know. That's a repeated comment too, but it's not action. Okay. And it's not evidence that that's really being taken place. So I'm, so you hear the frustration in my voice because it's the same, I get the same answer. I get through, I get the same response. So again, what are we going to do? What is the plan to do that? And speak to, speak to two specific things. Um, one thing is that we tried a different approach in the spring when we were forming our LCAP pack then. Um, by using more strategic queries of the families who, who attend our schools and, and do, who fall into the unduplicated people count uh, you know, classifications. So we, were, we, were, we initiated that in the spring and need to reinitiate that for this cycle now that we better understand the state's parameters. The second thing is we did hold two town halls for parents of students with disabilities. So Dr. Wagner could speak more to that if you have more specific questions about that, but those, those have happened recently since the spring cycle also. So the LCAP pack construct got underway in the spring, got halted because of COVID and now is being reactivated. But those are some of the strategies that are beyond just saying we're gonna, we're gonna outreach better. Those are two new things we've, do, we've done. 
Okay, that that I I don't want to no I I do want to keep uh, you know on this point about that in terms with regards to that because these groups that we're talking about groups with disabilities underrepresented they have not they're not new groups in this district and so what are again the question is not being asked you know what is going to be make sure that when we come with another presentation such as this that that those groups are going to be in, included what strategies are you going to do differently to make sure that that happens that's what i'm looking for and i and i you know so we got to figure out something a little bit happy because because it has nothing really to do with COVID. it might add a little bit on there but we were having this concern uh prior to that and so i really want to see this happen and i want and, and it's it's not good enough to say that you're going to do it because if, We've been saying we're going to do it for three years, right now going into the fourth year, and we cannot continue to do that. So we've got to think uh, outside the box to make sure that we are meeting these groups so they're not left outside and we're still talking about how we're going to do it. I want to know what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. Okay, Dr. Reed. Yeah, I, I just wanted to speak to that because uh, I would say, and I would agree with Ms. sims Moton. I mean, and I appreciate the fact that in 2016 when we first came on the board there was just it was the population and then other so i appreciate that other has has actually been named but i think what i hear Ms. sims moton saying and i think is really what are some community organizations and connections and a framework and a strategy that is is purposeful to those particular organizations that support um populations, persons with disabilities, African, African Americans, you know, Asian Americans. So what is, I, I think it would be really great to see a strategic plan of outreach and what organizations you are going to and how are you doing that? So you're doing town hall meetings, and you're doing, you're outreaching to community organizations, you're doing the parent forums, but really being strategic in the way of your outreach and then bringing it back to perhaps Ms. Sims Moton who has connections and, and, and different people in the community who are spearheading those groups to really see is this really um, uh, the way we should be going about doing it so that we don't come back and say well we tried and this is what we got but really this is strategically what we did so I, I'm what I would support Ms. Sims Moton saying what are the practical steps that you're going to take that you can lay out and frame that you took to achieve the insurance that you have the feedback from everyone that we need. So I, I, I would just add to that, that's what I'm saying. So I, 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 I've been saying that and I feel like Dr. Reed, I mean, you're trying to explain it differently than I'm saying, but the bottom line is we, are not, we have not addressed it. You can pluff it up, you can do a strategic plan. The bottom line, we have not taken care of it. That's, that's the bottom line. Uh, with regards to that, and so I just want to know what we're going to do, and if if you feel differently, and if you know, then I'm I'm ready to have an engagement about that. But I I, I you know I I've not seen the change, and I know that's necessary because we see these outcomes in our LCAPs, we see them in our dashboards. With these these students are not proficient, and so what are we doing? So we know how important parent engagement is. So I just want us to get a more comprehensive plan and something that I can see tangible uh, that that we're that we're moving toward that. Yes, we do not feel differently. Um, thank you for that input. And we will um, definitely before August 25th, we will bring to you that strategic plan of concrete steps. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this agenda item? Thanks to the team. Thanks for the presentation. Let's uh, bring this to, oh, no vote. This is just a uh, report. So appreciate that. Uh, we will move on to the next agenda item. My screen is frozen, so bear with me and we'll just go to uh, Superintendent Maldonado for this report. Thank you, President uh, Caps. We are going to just dive right into our update, update number four to the board on our school reopening plans. And I just wanna acknowledge this previous conversation and assure you that we will be working on getting you a, another plan that meets the needs that was that were expressed here tonight so with that i'll turn it over to dr wagonet and just a uh, 
point, uh, we do have public comment on this item, but we're going to do this after the report. We found that I found uh, that it's helpful to hear have the public hear <laughs> the update uh, before commenting if 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 that helps them. So that's the reason for shifting this when especially coming on issues of uh, the pandemic. So we will address the have a public comment after this. Thank you. Dr. Wagenek, would you like to get us started? You're on mute, Dr. Wagenek. All right, that's better. All right, uh, thank you, Superintendent Maldonado, uh, President Caps, and uh, school board. I'm, I'm pleased to kick off our fourth board report um, and our final board report um, prior to the beginning of school a week from today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you have seen this slide in each one of our um, presentations. Um, but it's important to continue to go over it because we do want to um, emphasize that we continue to organize our work into these um, drivers' priorities. Um, you're going to hear about distance learning in terms of instruction. Um, you'll also hear us talk tonight about community and family engagement. We will talk to you about facilities and operations, what work is going on uh, in that realm. Of course, health and wellness will also be covered. And really all of the work that we do stems from um, the governance and, and leadership um, with that lens towards equity and access. Next slide. So, um, we continue to watch the data as it comes along, and it's important to note that um, the state has been having um, trouble with their processing of data in terms of their disease uh, reporting system. Um, as I as I monitor the data each um, each night, uh, it's become clear that. Um, the, the county's getting its data, it seems to me, in sort of fits and starts. So for example, um, yesterday we had the highest number uh, single day reports uh, since the um, end of June when we began monitoring. We had 68 cases within our district boundaries yesterday. The day before that was, uh, I believe, 20. Uh, today that number was back down to 18. So. Um, the numbers go up and down, but what we do know is that um, COVID is very present in our county. It's also very present within our district boundaries. And another point we know is that there are many, many people who um, are not even being tested, that their physicians are telling them, um, regardless, um, don't go in for a test. I'm pretty sure you have it. And that's an issue uh, statewide in California that there is there are a lack of tests. And so um, doctors, rightfully so, are being uh, very judicious about recommending who gets tested and who doesn't. And so um, the number of tests only reflect those folks who, who actually are tested. Um, we, as uh, Ms. Ford mentioned in her earlier comments, um, the number of children ages zero to 17 in California has doubled in the last two weeks, those who are positive. And so um, we will continue to monitor this and, and watch the trends and report back to the board um, on a weekly basis. Next slide, please. Um, one, one phrase that you've heard a lot from me is um, that people are only as safe as they feel. Um, and, and that is the, at the forefront of our mind um, 
during COVID. Um, it's so important that we work to make sure during distance learning that um, even though we don't have students on campus, uh, except in, in rare individual cases, um, we still have a duty to keep our employees safe and visitors to our campus safe. Um, next board meeting, I'm going to be bringing to you um, a request for approval of the purchase of uh, iPass screening app. Um, and the way the iPass screening app works is um, that folks will use their, their phones or their computers to re respond to screening questions every morning. And so, for example, um, Ms. Caps, um, as a parent in our district, you'll get a notification every morning um, asking to um, questions about your child's health and asking safety questions. So this obviously is once we are out of um, out of distance learning and back into a hybrid or full return mode. But we're going to be screening individuals for um, COVID for the foreseeable future, um, definitely this school year and perhaps into next school year. So what this will allow us to do is to have families and employees do their screening uh, before they come onto campus. And then with their phones, they will show a QR code that indicates that they are cleared to come in. Um, what this will do is allow us to monitor um, those who are on campus and safe to be there. It will also, if people indicate um, that they have been exposed to others who have COVID or they do have symptoms, um, et cetera, it will indicate and let them know they should not come onto campus. And it lets us know um, what their status is at, uh, as well so that we can um, track the information and um, work with public health to figure out who may have been exposed to that individual. Um, so we'll be bringing that, but in the meantime, we are, we have set up a screening process. All of our employees um, fully back at some point this week, um, either remotely or in person. And so before anyone comes onto our campus or into our district buildings, they are screened um, using a Google Doc at this time. But we are looking forward to bringing the iPass screening app um, uh, to our community. Next slide. Um, first, I want to I want to thank the board for um, your comments earlier about uh, our work around mental health. Um, we it is something to be very proud of, and we are so fortunate in this community to have community-based organizations who we can work with, who um, are really top-notch organizations. Um, mental health is, um, right now in terms of COVID, it's the pandemic within the pandemic. And um, you've heard me talk um, in the last three or four board meetings about my own concerns with how this pandemic is impacting all of us. And um, so it, we have uh, funding through the CARES Act uh, to spend specifically on uh, COVID-related response uh, in the schools. And so we have allocated uh, $600,000 uh, from this CARES Act money that is specifically to be spent to address concerns around COVID in order to help our students um, and staff and families during this time. So I reached out to CALM and to FSA. Um, I wanna start with Family Service Agency. I said, can you, can you please um, you know, put together a plan for 
how we can address uh, mental illness around COVID. And what they came up with, with was um, awesome because as you can see here, it addresses students and it address, um, and they're ready to provide them this both in person when the time comes, but to do it remotely um, so that many, many students can participate at one time. So uh, everything from the groups, the mind gym, the rebound wellness, um, to crisis response for suicidality, because um, we don't, we really don't know what we are going to see when students return to school, be it in distance learning or otherwise. And so we want to be ready and able to um, participate in crisis response, and FSA is ready to do that. Um, increased access to therapeutic services for our students. So by increasing the number of therapists on our um, secondary school campuses, we'll be able to reach more students. Um, and that's through screening and therapy. The best, the next part um, I am excited about, and you know, the students are important, but also the adults who support the students um, need care as well. And so FSA is going to be running family support groups, holding coffee chats where people can come and just talk about how things are going, sort of a less uh, organized therapeutic group. Um, and then also a how to foster resilience group, because I think all of us can benefit from resilience. And then finally, FSA is going to be holding um, what's called reflective practice with um, any staff members who want that. And that's an opportunity to, um, for staff to talk through um, how their uh, relationships with students are going, um, how that's impacting their instruction, um, but also how they are doing and um, how they're taking care of themselves. And then also mental wellness opportunities for staff, be it individual or um, group counseling. So that's family service for our secondary. And then um, with CALM, um, offering services in preschool through sixth grade, similar sorts of things. And CALM was the same. Both of these organizations said, let us know how we can help you. We want to help. Um, and they've been helping. They never stopped working. Uh, with our students once the shutdown occurred. And so um, you can see they're, in, they're going to increase access to therapy. They're going to offer mindfulness uh, for parents, um, COVID coping groups. And then with staff, again, reflective practice and consultation. And then um, also webinars and training and trauma-informed practices because uh, post-traumatic stress um, from the pandemic is real and will continue to, to impact staff, uh, students, and uh, their parents. Next slide, please. Um, so we were just having a conversation about the importance of, of listening and reaching out to our families and um, in a more organized way about the work that we're doing. Um, so we're offering uh, childcare in the district um, specifically for our employees. Um, and the state has said that, I know it's, it's confusing for people because they hear that we're offering childcare on our school campuses and, the, and get confused. Why can you have childcare um, on campuses, but we can't have school. And um, really it comes down from the state recognizing that childcare is essential, um, weighing the importance of that. And so um, childcare can exist. It has to operate under very um, rigorous, strict, um, procedures. Unfortunately, we have two individuals, Daisy Ochoa and Kathy Serrano, who know how to do that. And so we'll be running um, the After School Education and Safety or ACES program for the children of our, our staff. Um, at the time we created this slide and published, 
Um, it was over 140 students. We now have 170 students enrolled in that program. Those are school-aged children um, who will really, it's a type of potting. They'll be at one of four schools um, and they'll be grouped together um, with other children in pods and will be engaged in their studies during the day that program is running from 7.30 to 4 o'clock. Um, and that program is staffed by Santa Barbara Unified staff. Um, and then at this point, I am going to um, turn it over to Cami Barnwell to share with uh, you more about our um, partnership with United Way. Thanks, Fran. Um, <clears throat> So we've been uh, talking to the board for at least a couple months about uh, a partnership that surfaced with the United Way when the United Way started approaching school districts. They, they built a consortium, a collaborative, to assist school districts all over the county with developing possible sites for students to go to when they can't be on actual campuses, can they be in other locations to log in, do distance learning, have a quiet, safe place to study, um, connect with their teachers. Um, and so I just wanted to update you, um, based on what Fran just mentioned, kind of a newer development, along with partnering with the United Way, uh, who's representing our school district and others to a lot of organizations in town that already do those kinds of things, say Boys and Girls Club, Girls Inc. We've also just been able to identify about 15 of our schools have space for about 20 to 30 kids each, so about 300 slots over 15 of our campuses where we can have some child care type of activities going on per these guidelines that, that Dr. Wagenek just mentioned. So these are students that could go to any of our schools, um, but the key thing is that priority is being given to the students with greatest needs. So there's, a, there's a, an eligibility criteria that's pretty strict, <clears throat> and we are working in tandem with the United Way on making sure that that criteria is met. So the greatest needs first. Um, and we, we realize that the, that's not going to really address the demand overall for child care across the, the district or the South Coast, but it gets us started um, for providing a few more spots where students who may need it can go to just have the quiet place to focus and learn. Um, so we'll, we'll probably be reporting back to you more about that once, that, once that's up and running. Um, Secondly, I didn't, it's not on the slide, but I, I had it as an afterthought that I realized I wanted to mention um, this partnership that's been ongoing and longstanding and super critical to the district with the Santa Barbara Education Foundation. They are, Margie Yavi and her team are assisting us with a kind of a wish list campaign where they will be matching donations to needs that are identified by teachers or families, student needs that can help alleviate some of the pressures um, and just enhance distance learning. So you'll be hearing more about that. The, the concept has been, has existed for quite some time. Ed, the Ed Foundation matches teachers needs, students needs to donations, but this will be more concrete around distance learning and um, maybe just a few select things so someone could make a small donation even towards something that could serve a student who might need uh, support in some way. So you'll hear more about that from us in the coming weeks once we have a better sense from teachers where some of those gaps are. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Sean now, thanks. All right, thanks Cami. We have lots of um, very timely and exciting updates in the realm of teaching and learning. Um, when it comes to dual language immersion, we have our two sites where we'll be implementing uh, DLI programs. It is uh, Santa Barbara Junior High is going to have a DLI program this school year, the one we're about to start. There are 27 students enrolled. We've hired uh, the coordinator for that program who will also serve as the Spanish teacher and social studies teacher. And we last week had an evening parent, parent orientation webinar. 
um, and bringing together this, the staff and families associated with DLI at Santa Barbara Junior High. Um, at McKinley School, using a, a new meta-aligned interview process, um, that, that effort yielded three new hires that are highly qualified instructors for serving in a DLI model. And that program, again, uh, as a reminder, is uh, slated to start in fall 2021, so next school year. And we are positioning ourselves very well um, to, to do that with highly qualified staff. Uh, and the curriculum front, as we've just uh, experienced tonight, we are really thrilled to have the approval, the board's approval of, of our FOSS science uh, curriculum, as well as our English language, designated English language development curriculum for elementary grades. Do know that all secondary teachers are also being trained um, in pre-service hours for integrated English language development. So a real focus on English language development uh, across the full TK-12 spectrum as we come up on the fall, uh, on the beginning of school next week. Um, and just to, some things to highlight in ethnic studies because we have some exciting developments there. Uh, we've just posted, we've just gone live with a web page on our district's website that's dedicated to ethnic studies. That webpage provides an overview of our journey as a community to implementing ethnic studies as a grad requirement, which is unique and, and, and across the state as our superintendent pointed out in her opening remarks. It has information about the qualifying courses to satisfy that requirement, and to, including two new courses created uh, by, our, by our own staff and in conjunction with community input, um, and it has other resources related to ethnic studies. I want to highlight that in the two years since the grad requirement was, appro was approved, the Board of Education approved it in November uh, 2018, we've identified a dozen teachers who participate in regular professional learning and they collaborate to develop curriculum in conjunction with uh, the Ethnic Studies Consortium, Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara, and state level experts in ethnic studies. The curriculum that we use is based on the state's model curriculum for ethnic studies and it will continue to be adapted as needed. For example, we just had a, a new release from the, from the CDE um, of the model curriculum. There were some revisions to the model curriculum. What we call the Ethnic Studies Cadre, which is the group of teachers working on ethnic studies, it includes four teachers that were hired specifically to support the implementation of ethnic studies since May of last year. Uh, and we're just excited that beginning next week, we're gonna be initiating our four-year implementation phase. And that will bring over 1,500 students um, into ethnic studies courses across our three large high schools. We want to be clear that we've heard and are in support of the demands of our community and Black Student Youth Santa Barbara. We're committed to expanding our course offerings in conjunction with those demands. And I know Dr. Becchio and Human Resources is also committed to a collaborative effort to transform our hiring practices in support of a high quality ethnic studies program. So two final points about ethnic studies. One is that um, we have the website that will provide the community with the course outlines associated with our newly developed courses and other resources, including some sample lessons and selected texts. But the best way to become familiar with ethnic studies in Santa Barbara will be to participate in upcoming and what we hope are ongoing opportunities for community engagement. So this will include events like our initial community forum, which we just recently postponed because we want to ensure broader community outreach um, and open house events that are associated with the classes themselves that we had an experience of that with the pilot course last school year. By definition, ethnic studies is a dynamic and transformational discipline. It's continually being reimagined in order to ensure that it's responsive to students and our local context. So we will continue to update the community through board meetings and through our district website and through those other community engagement opportunities I just named. We want to make it clear to everyone, we've received many questions about community service and our high school staff um, have as well, that we are continuing to suspend the community service requirement due to the public health guidelines that limit in-person interactions in the community. So we've got 6,000 uh, and some high school students who have a community service requirement to fulfill as a graduation requirement. Um, but at this time, that is not an essential function of what needs to occur and it's not it's not a viable requirement to be holding students to at this time we're going to continue to monitor the changing conditions and ultimately um, we foresee we might need to create a waiver 
um, depending on how long we remain in, in distance learning mode and, and what those changing public health uh, guidelines are. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Roundy Harder, Dr. Ann Roundy Harder. Thank you, Ms. Carey, and good evening to President Capps, board members, uh, Superintendent Maldonado, and our Santa Barbara community. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm really excited to be here uh, with you this evening to talk about something very close to my heart, which is teaching and learning that's in support of our students and supports that we have for teachers in that process as well. So I'm gonna take a moment to kind of talk through our distance learning plan. And as I begin, I really wanna acknowledge that this was um, a very carefully constructed and cross-departmental document that we created for the distance learning plan. And so I, one of the silver linings of COVID is that it's in some ways brought us closer together, even as we're socially distanced, but it's brought us together as a team, ed services, student services, business services, HR, and of course, our educational technology services without which we could not even have distance learning at all. And so this was just a, a monumental effort of weeks and many late nights and weekends to create. So I, I wanna give a special thank you to the entire team for pulling together um, under Superintendent Maldonado's um, wise leadership. So the distance learning plan is really designed to give an overview to our community in a broad outline of where we are now but it's also a living and breathing document. And what I mean by that is that we covered a lot of territory in the plan, including things like nutrition and how students will have access to devices and some of the things that we need to consider very broadly across the district. Most especially, of course, how are we going to support teachers in this transition to remote learning? So that broad outline of the distance learning plan was taken to heart by all of our principals who then adapted and took into consideration what was in the plan that would work for their school sites and they created webinars that they gave at least twice and which have been recorded so that they'll be available for anyone who wasn't able to attend those webinars specific to each of their school sites and we shared with the principals that this is something where we're looking at a slice in time but we know that these efforts of continued learning and support will need to go on all through the year, even if we are able, and we hope that we are, able to return on to campus. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important is to understand that these resources for families are not static, that we will continue to build and listen to our community as we grow our distance learning plan for the year. In particular, I wanna talk about some of the aspects of the professional learning within that distance learning plan. And I wanna thank um, Santa Barbara Teachers Association in particular for working closely with us on an agreement that allowed for our teachers to be engaging in seven hours of professional learning minimum, because we know many did more than that uh, of their own accord on their own time. But, seven hours at least of professional learning so that we can establish a base of common understanding across the entire district. And when we say that, we're really talking the whole span, you know, preschool all the way through 12th grade. So our professional learning plan was designed specifically in response to what we heard from our teachers and community that while we were in a crisis situation this spring, we wanted to make sure that we were offering a true distance learning environment for our students this fall and that teachers felt prepared and would continue to be supported throughout the year. In particular, we've provided some particular uh, supports for them. One of them is the distance learning playbook and this, we purchased 915 copies of the distance learning playbook which if you know the names Doug Fisher, Nancy Frey or John Hattie, these are world-renowned researchers who put together this playbook. And the playbook was offered as an ebook, and paper versions will be coming out in the next few days to the sites. So this is for all of our certificated staff to engage in to really have robust learning that can continue all through the year at their own pace, as we know is important for adult learners. 
There are multiple entry points. Uh, we wanted to make sure that learning was accessible and flexible as much as possible while having some common understandings. So things that are included in the playbook, for example, it talks about pedagogy. What works with students regardless of being online or not? And then what particular tips help us in an online learning environment? How can you build positive, engaging classroom communities and relationships with students when you meet them over a screen? How do you work on a feedback and assessment if you're not directly watching over your student's shoulder in a way that's meaningful, relevant, timely, and supportive of student learning? It also talks about the power of teacher collaboration, which, which fits in very well with our focus on teacher PLCs. And it provides some tangible resources such as lesson templates, videos, and um, actual supports that teachers can use right away. We've also provided technological support for, for teachers as learners with a shift to remote learning through Link Spring, um, a platform that has over 200 modules. We did ask all teachers to have a common base of understanding through the shift to remote learning cycle. And then also we understand and recognize the importance of social emotional learning for all of our teachers and students. And so we did give them some choice in terms of what they could be learning within the Link Spring. Additionally, I want to say that I'm so grateful for all of the instructional leads, coordinators, and other people who did come together across departments to create really robust training, for example, with our NEO modules, Google Classroom, and so on. And we are hearing from teachers that they're grateful We've had a few technical glitches along the way sometimes, but for the most part, we're hearing a lot of gratitude from teachers in terms of being able to have choice to learn more about these things that they asked for, um, you know, from their experience in the spring and to be able to be responsive uh, to their needs. So while we will continue with content and grade specific learning as well, we spring and through the playbook and other resources, that students, excuse me, teachers as students can be accessing all year long. So one thing I'd like to highlight is at this time sharing a teacher voice. And so if we can navigate to the audio file, please. This is one of our amazing junior high teachers, Kareem Battle, who just spontaneously shared his thoughts and said we could share with you. Please enjoy. There was, there was previously an audio file here between the two on the right hand side. Is the audio file missing? <laughs> okay, well, I said technical glitches occur and this might be one tonight, but we're very happy to share with you some of the kinds of things that uh, were said, which is just bubbling enthusiasm for helping teachers understand more about META, which you'll hear about in just a moment, for giving them the technological tools that they need, and for giving them some choice and understanding about how to support our students with social emotional learning. So I do think it's important for our board members to hear that from Mr. Battle, um, and so hopefully we can share the audio file at a later time uh, with you and make that public as well. Uh, we, I heard from one high school teacher who within a couple of days of launching all of this professional learning sent a very long and enthusiastic email just saying, I didn't even know what I didn't know and thank you so much. And that meant a lot to me personally and professionally that we are trying to meet teachers where they are. And we know that some are very technologically savvy and they can just soar beyond everything that we would imagine. And they will be working with their colleagues um, to share that information, I'm sure. So speaking of sharing information at this time, I would like, unless there are questions from the board, and right now I can't see everybody, so I'm not sure. Uh, I only see Ms. Carey at the moment and the slide. But uh, unless there are questions, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Ms. M Maria Larios-Horton, to share more about the Meta Three Lines work. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Roundy Harder. Um, I'm really, really excited to share more about the launch of our Introduction to Meta, which again stands for Multilingual Excellence Transforming Achievement, um, a course that was launched for certificated staff. And I am so pleased to, to share that we have received overwhelming support from our educators. Um, some of that in, um, support I've shared and passed along to, to our school board members. And um, again, most the most recent email came from our County Teacher of the Year, uh, Mr. Frank Koroshek, who said it was the best learning module he's participated in thus far. So that was excellent glowing feedback for us. The excitement really is around um, the core meta through lines, which speak to the importance of creating culturally sustaining classrooms where students feel seen and heard. Many teachers who have been, um, as well as the, uh, the many teachers who have already been working on these instructional shifts, which are presented in Meta, such as curriculum that represents the varied cultures, languages, and experiences of our students, they've said to me that they feel extremely validated in, in our work um, through Meta and also with encouragement for the work ahead and requests to be involved and included in the leadership efforts around META. Um, specifically, some of the feedback we received was re with regard to the appreciation to the link uh, in our META uh, course to the Black Youth SB demands and a very special embedded video message to teachers from Talia Hamilton, a leader uh, in this movement. So um, separately, aside from the Meta Introduction course, we've also launched a separate course for secondary educators focused on supporting emergent multilingual learners in distance learning, which included research-based and subject-specific resources and strategies to build off of some of the already great work happening um, in, uh, in our district with our teachers, our secondary teachers. Specifically in elementary, a separate course was uh, provided to all elementary uh, staff, um, certificated staff, uh, which launched some foundational learning required um, of our very anticipated FOSS designated ELD implementation for this year, for which we have also heard great feedback. And none of this could have been done without the, the amazing support as Dr. Roundy Hardy has uh, already mentioned, uh, of our instructional leads and our consultants who have spent many, many hours developing these courses for our educators with great care, uh, understanding the challenge ahead. Um, and again, high expectations come with high support. Um, so with that, um, we're open to questions at the end of, of this presentation as well, but I'd li also like to now turn it over to my colleague, Sierra, who will share more about what's happening in the elementary space. Good evening again. I wanna start by uh, thanking the board for passing the resolution to empower Superintendent Maldonado to make quick and thoughtful um, purchases and um, approvals for things that we would need as soon as we could to transition to distance learning. And I'm excited to tell you that uh, we have been very thoughtful in what we have acquired and we'll be rolling out a lot of supports for our students and families. Um, first and foremost, we recognize that students are going to need materials that they normally would be provided at school at their homes. And so your principal leads are actively preparing packets and packages to go home that have all of the materials that they may need from post-its to pencils to crayons to all the little goodies that make elementary students thrive. Additionally, I'd like to thank Anna Pilhofer, our PLC art teacher, for putting together a comprehensive order for art kits to go home. So our kids will have access to the arts and the materials that they need to successfully be taught art um, during distance learning. Additional resources include actual books books for kids in their hand. I'm very excited that we will be distributing books based on students' reading levels in collaboration with teachers and our library techs. And principals will be relaying about how these materials will be safely distributed to you. 
One of our big purchases was in book kits. And these are for book clubs. So kids can all have a shared experience of a book and we can rotate these book clubs and continue the learning through active engagement uh, in the workshop model with teacher support. Additional resources are digital and print. Among these digital resources, that will be a valuable contribution to our teachers' ability to have small groups and to confer with individual students in their sessions is the Teacher College Reading and Writing Projects videos in reading, writing, and phonics. And very excited that K through six will be getting words their way, which it focuses on spelling inventories, phonemic awareness, phonics, and word origins and word study. Um, additionally, the district picked up all the costs for the notebooks. And as all, all districts in California seem to be doing, uh, ordering whiteboards uh, for the kids to be able to show their work on it. Um, additionally, as we previously discussed, we are definitely thinking about how to bring the learning outdoors and how to support outdoor instruction in distance learning, in collaboration with our partners in the appropriate safe um, formats. And I think the step that you took today as a board with uh, proving FOSS is going to be huge in that endeavor and not only to cultivate a love of science, but also to really empower the critical collaboration and communication skills our emergent multilingual students need. Um, there is a lot of technology that we need in distance learning, and we were very strategic with vetting these resources and determining which would move forward and ensuring that all schools have access by funding them through district-wide purchases. So again, I thank the board for that and Superintendent Maldonado for her direction. And for more on technology, I'm gonna turn it over to Todd Rickman. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, President Caps and uh, board members. Uh, like has been mentioned several times, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about what's going on. And Sierra hit on, on a number of the, um, the additional supports we're providing. One thing I'll point out that uh, Ms. Ford mentioned is that for those of us who spend a lot of time in the classroom, this time of year is really exciting. And um, for me, even during COVID, it's no different. I'm really excited because I, I get to see behind the curtain every day of the incredible work that's going on to ensure that our, our kids have a great learning experience. So before I start talking about the platforms that, that we're adopting, I just wanted to share with the board that in over the course of about eight days, we've distributed over 2,000 iPads and about 400 hotspots to families. Um, we expect to be fully deployed by the end of the week. Uh, so that, that a lot of credit goes to the ETS team who has gone uh, above and beyond even delivering hotspots and iPads to homes to families who can't get to the district office. With that, I, I'd like to talk about the platforms that we were adopting. Coming out of the spring, we had uh, our, our amazing teachers shared a number of platforms they found really useful uh, during distance learning in the spring. We vetted a number of these platforms and purchased district licenses, um, as, as uh, Sierra mentioned. These, these platforms represent best in class. Um, they're teacher requested and often previously used uh, by certain sites, certain, certain groups of teachers. Uh, one of the things that I want the board and public to know is that we're going to be launching a website uh, for parents uh, that has how-to uh, documents and videos on these adopted platforms so they can support their students at home. Uh, I'm going to uh, just focus on a couple. Um, many of them have been mentioned already today, but I'm going to focus on a couple. Um, Zoom, you see, that's not new to us, but we had, um, when COVID hit last year, Zoom provided free licenses to education, uh, but they weren't full licenses. So we, we purchased full licenses for all teachers that includes a number of additional collaboration tools uh, that they'll be able to use with their students. You see Nearpod listed on this slide. Nearpod is a platform that allows teachers to create complete distance learning lessons. And the exciting thing about it, 
uh, is that it has 7,500 standard or line grab and go lessons uh, for, for teachers to use. Uh, we feel that this is gonna be a huge support uh, to teachers moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. One of the, the platforms that I'd, I'd like to spend some time uh, talking a little bit about more about is a platform called Paper. Uh, for those who, who have students in the district, you might have heard the, the name Grade Slam. So Paper uh, was, was formerly Grade Slam. They've just changed their name. And what Paper is, is a platform uh, that provides unlimited tutoring to students, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in all subjects. Tutors are uh, available in both Spanish and English, or I should say Spanish and English tutors are available. Um, and all of these tutors are either credentialed teachers or trained vetted online educators. Um, paper offers essay review with annotation and with a turnaround of about 24 hours. Uh, the tutoring is live and text-based. It's not, it doesn't uh, use video. Uh, and tutoring session logs uh, provide teachers with critical information regarding uh, student areas for uh, growth. One thing that I, I want to share is that teachers will be sharing uh, this platform with their students. We'll also be making an announcement about it to parents when we have completed our training materials, which should happen uh, by the end of this, this week. Those materials, as I mentioned, and other resources related to our learning platforms will be available in both English and Spanish on a web page specifically for parents. Uh, we're putting in the finishing touches on that website and should have it posted within the next day or so. When it comes to the use of paper, parents or principals have committed to making sure their teachers use the platform uh, and make it part of their classroom culture. Students will be expected to use paper regularly. Uh, and paper can use, be used uh, as more than just a tutoring platform. It can actually assist teachers in delivery of uh, and support of first instruction. And perhaps most importantly, there's an entire insights data dashboard for teachers that is extremely helpful in informing teacher practice. Our tech coaches are providing training on the use of paper uh, itself and the dashboard in particular. So we're really excited to, to be able to provide this to our community. We know that uh, private tutoring costs a lot and, and the ability to, to, it really excites us to be able to provide this to all of our families. Um, and I will now pass it off to Miss Carey. Thank you. It's a delight always to talk about our PEAK and AVID programs, which serve over 800 students in our high schools, grades 9 through 12. And PEAK and AVID really form kind of a braided initiative that help to create more opportunities for first generation college students in terms of promoting their career readiness and their access. Uh, and in turn, that helps us close our opportunity gap here locally. Our peak learning centers are staffed by 40 members of the, of the peak learning center teams. Um, the centers traditionally, when we're not in a distance learning mode, operate on our, on our school campuses. And of course, all the centers are privately funded with uh, the incredible generosity of our community partners. Um, we're very excited because in the spring, we learned about the need, um, the critical role that these peak learning centers play when we suddenly didn't have access to them. And so what we did thoughtfully in the spring is design a model that we could deploy in this school year as we start it, whereby the peak learning centers will be available, as you see here, Monday through Thursday, every evening for two and a half hours via a Zoom video platform we focus on science and math courses, which are the areas uh, that students have the most need and demand for, for tutoring support. We take attendance daily and share that information with the academic counselors for students. And a really cool fact is that 80% of our tutors and our learning center uh, teams are local graduates. Um, and so that allows for other kinds of, of opportunities besides just the tutoring alone. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Becchio. Thank you, and once again, good evening, board members. Um, I'm gonna bring you a really brief um, HR update. I uh, selected just a few topics that you see on the next slide um, once that gets changed. And um, 
and I wanted to just bring you just a little information about these three topics. One is a substitute plan. As soon as we realized we were going to a full distance learning, uh, we really needed to make a pivot around how we were going to deal with teachers that were absent and a substitute teacher plan. And so um, in, in short, what we're doing is um, we're in the process of hiring two long-term substitutes for each school site. They'll be de dedicated to those sites for the first semester. They would be trained and issued devices. And um, so the challenge right now is hiring around 40, uh, 40 subs to serve that purpose. So we're not going to be using our regular call uh, system that calls subs when there's a teacher that's, that's absent. Um, so that we think that'll work better to, to have uh, two reliable people that can fill in whenever needed on whatever day that is. As far as negotiations, um, you know, all I'll share with you, there's some bullet points there, but I'll share with you that we, um, you know, really, I'm, I'm really impressed with the work that happened in negotiations. Um, I'm appreciative of SBTA and CSEA who uh, their teams made up of, of course, teachers and classified staff really stayed focused on you know, while we were dealing with uh, getting language around the health and safety of employees, uh, they really stayed focused with us on the needs of our, our students and families and our overarching goal of, as an organization of, of serving those needs. And um, we did reach agreement today with CSEA, tentative agreement. So I'll be bringing forward next board meeting, uh, a tentative agreement for your uh, review and approval. And then I uh, wanted to mention employee leaves because again, this is a topic right now we're spending a lot of time on. Uh, we're getting a lot of requests for particular circumstances that employees have around COVID-19 that uh, we've developed a process. Uh, it's kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, someone that requests work accommodations either goes into an interactive dialogue process with HR whereby we have a meeting with the supervisor and an employee and talk through the, the health issues um, or disabilities, if they have a disability, the issues around that and um, accommodations that might be necessary. And then there's a flexible work modification meeting that we um, can also uh, have when it's an employee that may have childcare issues or um, a family member that's um, high risk for COVID that they take care of. So those are some of the examples and uh, we work through what those modifications might be. So those are the HR updates. I actually um, want to mention something that Sean Carey referred to, but I think it's really important, not necessarily related to COVID, but um, related to our um, student demands from our Black Student Youth Santa Barbara. Um, myself and, and Ann Peake, who's the Director of Human Resources, are, are still um, focused on those recent student demands and um, particularly around recruiting and hiring a diverse teacher workforce. So um, we responded to those demands in HR by um, really stating that we would take a deep dive into our both recruiting and hiring practices uh, between now and December. And so I just wanted to make mention that we're still on track for that. And um, with that, I want to turn it over to Ms. Chate. Thank you for your time. Thanks, John. So you've been seeing a lot of action going on that what our team has been doing. And you're probably wondering, how the heck are we paying for all of this? So fortunately, we've gotten five buckets of money so far. Um, we haven't actually received the money, but the money has been documented with a number behind it. So we have, care, we have um, SB 117, which we got pretty early on. And um, as you can see, that was for PPE and it wasn't a ton of money. Then we got the CARES Act money, which comes in as a federal form, in federal form and in state form. And it's kind of broken out in the other four buckets. Um, Chelsea talked about how the money's to be used. And um, we have been using it quite quickly. Um, the ESSER money um, in the beginning was identified as a lot of PPE. Um, caught, um, that's what it was allocated for and amongst other things. And so we've been purchasing everything out of that bucket. Um, if that is not the case for PPE, we will um, present to FEMA for reimbursement. 
Next slide, please. Oh, I, I meant, I'm sorry, I meant to mention that we have, um, we've, we will be receiving $10.9 million and that averages out to about $830 per kid. And, you know, that's, it, when you break it down like that, it's not a lot of money considering like an iPad is like $430. Um, so this slide shows where we have spent all, um, spent some of the money. We have not depleted our buckets yet, and, but we have put a good dent in them. As you can see, the educational materials are in the dark green or bluish green and um, they've just gotten started on that. They've decided what they want to buy and a lot of orders are going out right now. This is as of October, I mean August 5th. Then we have some staffing as John mentioned that's going to be that's right there that's mostly the substitutes. The food as you can see is a big chunk of the pie and that's due to that we've been funding or serving kids since very beginning of shutting down schools on March 16th. And we continue to do that um, all the way till whenever COVID is ended and beyond. So that's a big chunk of the money there. We're using some of it um, to help support the lack of um, funding and the lack of um, and that being able to keep our employees, um, we are, they're called essential employees and we are not allowed to um, let any of them go. We also have in the pinker slide is the mental health. And um, as Dr. Wagonack spoke before about that. And then the personal protective equipment, the PPE. Again, we started right away because we didn't know how it was going, we were going to reopen school, but we wanted to be prepared and we knew that every, every, every state was going to have the same requirements about reopening school and the supply and demand was going to be great. And we've done a really good job of getting all of that here. Um, we're offering um, more than two masks per uh, student and teacher and face shields and plexiglass and sanitizers. So the schools are ready. And um, so that's how we've expanded, expensed our funds so far. Um, I believe there's about 4 million left and I'm sure that, you know, this slide will expand in different directions. Next slide. And I believe we're gonna go talk to Matt Dittman about food service. Thank you, Matt, and good evening. Um, just some basic que questions you might have, I guess, with food services, you know, who can we serve? It is going to be changing a little bit uh, due to um, current federal, federal waivers that are going to be coming into place right when school starts. And unfortunately, it will make it more challenging and more difficult for us to feed everyone we want to feed. Um, uh, we will only be able to be fully reimbursed for students within our district. Um, and it will we also require us to obtain some form of, of student identification, whether that's an ID card, an ID number, or a last name. Uh, we're working with uh, IT to develop a barcode scanning system that will be sent out to all the uh, families in our district, and that will hopefully speed up the process as well. We still plan on continuing to serve uh, uh, breakfast and lunch at 11 sites and supper at four sites. And um, in terms of HR, how are we gonna staff? Well, we plan on safely rotating our staff, uh, much like we did when COVID first hit in March. And uh, it'll be a little bit different, we think. It'll be about 75% of our staff will be inside of our kitchens producing and distributing meals on any given day. And then 25% uh, will be on call and ready to substitute if uh, a kitchen or staff is impacted by COVID. Uh, and so our costs, um, we have incurred significant losses during COVID. Um, it, it's been uh, quite uh, high uh, and we do anticipate uh, because of the new tighter regulations uh, 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 of these waivers that those uh, losses will be even more. Um, we have been and uh, um, Board President uh, Caps has uh, been a part of trying to um, move Congress and uh, our representatives to uh, reevaluate these waivers. But as of yet, uh, nothing has been decided in that regard. 
And so I think it, it's going back to Mrs. Che. Thank you, Matt. So, you know, it's been a long time that we have had a structural deficit um, in food service and, and then we got hit with COVID, which has made it worse, as Matt said. But I want you to understand that we have made reductions to our budget to help with that structural deficit. We've terminated the leases of our um, six mobile cafes. That leaves us two left. But the reason why we, get, we terminated the lease, they weren't being used as much. They were breaking down. They were over 200,000 miles on them and we couldn't afford it anymore. So we say this year we'll save about $165,000 for that. Uh, we no longer provide free breakfasts for those who don't qualify due to their income is too high. And as you, as the board is well aware that that was a huge cost to the um, food service. We've renegotiated our vendor program agreements. So we, there's no, we're not going to lose um, money on the vendors and some of our vendors have not come back to us because they couldn't afford the the prices that we needed to get to so we didn't run the program at a loss um we terminated the lease in santa maria and that is something we've wanted to do because it's really hard to manage um a kitchen that's 60 miles away but the reason why it was terminated was they have um we were renting the good sam um some good samaritan kitchen and they have a really high COVID rate and the kitchen was shut down. So we've moved um, one of our vended programs down to DP and Goleta Valley and they're running, they're providing the meals to them. Um, we've, need, we've renegotiated contracts with the vendors and training programs with vendors and training programs and reduced um, some of our labor due to attrition. And I will turn it over to Fran. All right, so um, good evening again. I'm going to ask um, Mr. Rouse to click on the data link that's there. Uh, Mr. Rouse or whoever's working the slide deck. You click on the data link, please. All right, we will not go to the data link then. Um, so what we have seen is um, a decline in enrollment in the last year. And um, uh, in, in the last month, rather. And at this time of, this, of the year, we normally see a bit of a, an increase. Um, but um, as we look at our enrollment every day, which, which is a, a regular practice this time of year, um, in July, we started seeing a drop off, uh, especially towards the end of July and then uh, into last week, and, and we found this, this decline um, that was 125 students last week and has increased up um, uh, close to 140 as of today. What we found is that elementary students comprise 22% of our total enrollment, but they represent 65% of this decrease. So what we did was analyze and look at where are we losing students and it was uh, predominantly um, Adams and Roosevelt Elementary, although all of our elementary uh, schools lost students, um, notably Cleveland and McKinley. Um, 
Adams and Roosevelt this time of year normally see an increase in students as a result of an influx of uh, transfers students. Um, but we again are not seeing that. Um, Cleveland and McKinley, we believe we're um, losing students because of transfers, the late transfers going to other schools, but also um, families moving out because of economic necessity. So when we ask, well, why is this happening? Um, you know, we do believe there's economic distress. We're hearing regularly about families who are moving out of town uh, because of COVID, loss of jobs, um, lower income, et cetera. Um, but also we do know that and have heard from families who um, are choosing to uh, form pods that um, are separate from our district and are taught by a teacher and are a type of homeschooling. Um, and then we know that some students are moving to private schools that have um, setups that are um, more conducive to what the families are looking uh, for at this time. And really, you know, the big, the big message here as, as we see this decline in students and reflect on it is that families, um, you know, parents are all having to make decisions um, about what's best for their children. And that's something we completely understand, um, whether it be because of economic distress or because of um, wanting a different kind of learning and uh, not opting for distance learning. Um, also, what we know is that for those families who are enrolled with us, the, the 13,000 plus students who will be with us in the coming year, um, as you've seen tonight, the preparation for distance learning um, has, has been, in my opinion, as, as I watch my colleagues prepare, it's been, it's excellent. And that's what we want our families to know, is that they are going to be pleased with the, um, the learning that their children engage in. Um, we all are looking forward to the day when we can come back um, to school campuses and have um, children and adolescents um, on campus and in classrooms. But in the meantime, um, we are looking forward to what this opportunity um, of distance learning can, can provide. So in terms of enrollment, uh, we, we felt it was necessary to talk to the board about this decline, point it out, um, and you know, just try to make sense and meaning of it. Um, we'll continue to monitor these numbers as we go along. Um, I'll also use this as an opportunity to talk about the fact that, um, you know, we're no longer a district that relies on ADA or average, average daily attendance uh, for our income. We are a community uh, funded or what was formerly called basic aid district. And so while we do rely on student attendance for some of our funding, um, the vast majority of it does come from our property tax base. Um, and, and so um, we don't anticipate um, a large fiscal uh, impact from the loss of students. Um, and then finally, in terms of enrollment, um, you know, we do have some families that are um, coming into town, um, enrolling, um, or haven't been with us previously and they're wanting to enroll and we will continue to enroll and we want families to contact us um, if they need any assistance with that. So if, if the board does hear from folks who need assistance, please uh, point them in the direction of student services. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Barnwell for our final slide. Thanks, Fran. Um, so this last slide um, was added in at the very end because this, these pictures are taken from Friday. Um, and if you can see them, you'll see this is just like a handful of some of the shots that we got. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to 
thank Fran, Dr. Wagenek, and Meg Jeté for the leadership around making sure that we could really get our heads around all of the health and safety information around COVID, but also the requirements and the things that needed to be purchased um, and be in place in an extremely timely fashion to be ready to, to move forward next week, um, or actually even this week. <laughs> So they're both just an incredible um, wealth of information on this and have helped us have a strategy around making sure every campus, including the district office, has all of the appropriate, appropriate supplies in place and procedures and protocols in place. Um, so what we did last week was we kind of sp spread out and cabinet members went and visited different sites, different campuses with this checklist that requires you to really like fine tune every procedure, every protocol. We did walkthroughs with the principals, um, talk to them in detail, just to kind of go through and make sure that they had everything in place. And it's, you know, you'll see some of the pictures, but it's everything from the thermometers and face shields and a certain number of face shields and the proper signage, the the procedures around how to screen people when they walk up to the building um, and certain steps that have to happen. Um, hand sanitizer stations, they're just everywhere. <laughs> uh, plexiglass that's been installed to protect people who are, have more public facing roles. Uh, all the cleaning supplies, the masks, everything. It was, it's just really impressive. I, I had the, um, the benefit of going to La Cuesta and doing the walkthrough there. Um, and I was so impressed with how well prepared they were to receive people. And I, at this point, obviously, it's in a very limited fashion. It's teachers who may be coming to their classrooms to do the distance learning for, them, for their classrooms or one-on-one -on -one interactions that might happen with students. Um, of course, we just mentioned to you that we've got some of these child care centers that were going to be having at various campuses. So we have to be set up in a safe fashion to receive people, our staff who are bringing their students to us to, so, so all of these elements had to be just super precise. And I just was so impressed, we all were. And so I just wanted to say, I feel like we're really ready. And with that, I want to pass it back to um, with our superintendent Maldonado for a couple few final comments. Thanks. I said a lot of very important things before I was unmuted. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody. Board members, as you can see, the team has been working really hard uh, from everything from A to Z when it comes to opening our school again. And I'm really proud of the fact that we've been doing it under ever-changing conditions, guidance that changes sometimes daily, sometimes three times a day. And I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that I want to thank our food service workers, our maintenance workers who have not stopped working since March. Uh, we keep talking about people coming back to work, but there are many employees in this uh, organization that I want to commend for their continued working um, to get us all ready. I also want to thank our principals who are probably, uh, their heads are probably spinning with, the, again, us trying to get information to them as quickly as possible, changing some of our plans as we become more and more strategic and more attuned as a team. I know that in times of crisis, constant consistent communication, even if it's the same information, but working together, coming together as a team is what's gonna make this uh, work really happen for everybody. And I'm really proud to say that that's what I've been observing in my first month here. And uh, kudos to everyone. And we're open for your questions or comments at this point. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. We need to go to our uh, public speaker first before the board has a chance for questions and comments. So Mr. Hio, if you don't mind introducing our speaker. Yes, of course, um, President Caps. we have one speaker for this item, um, Karen McBride. And Karen, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so good evening, President Caps and members of the board, Superintendent Maldonado. 
there seems to be a theme tonight acknowledging the hard work and the energy that's going into starting this highly unprecedented school year. And I want to acknowledge everyone that I worked alongside throughout the summer, including the district leadership team and my dedicated and creative colleagues in the Santa Barbara Teachers Association who served on various teams and committees all summer long. Uh, the professionalism and commitment of the people throughout this district has really been inspiring to me, really, truly. And I, I wanna say that from my heart, I thank you. Um, if you're in this Zoom or if you're home taking care of your personal needs and family, if you hear me, I, I really wanna thank you. Um, but now I want to focus my comments on the volunteer work that's been done by the certificated staff of this district because I want to ensure the public of the level of commitment of these folks in a time when there is sometimes a harsh light shed on the changes we're experiencing in our schools. And I say volunteer work because most of our certificated staff have not yet begun their paid work year. Um, I want to ensure the public that it would be so much easier for everyone if we could just resume teaching, be in comfort of our classrooms with our students and form the relationships in person with those kids. Um, that's why we do what we do. That's why we gravitate towards education, but we're not doing that for now as we open the school year. So I wanna let you know some of the things that my colleagues, your children's educators have been doing this summer in support of your babies. Um, I would estimate that these folks have put in thousands of hours on behalf of service to our district just in the last month. Because remember, we're talking about almost 800 employees. Um, they have collaborated on plans for greater equity and inclusion, prepared materials for take-home kits for elementary students, uh, and for CTE classes like culinary arts and construction arts. They've been purchasing extra lab equipment for science classes, changing syllabi for new class structures. They've been working on student to student orientation programs for incoming freshmen at high schools. They've been attending multiple voluntary staff meetings, site leadership team meetings and uh, professional learning community meetings. They've been producing videos and supporting the onboarding of brand new educators. Uh, they've attended all kinds of specialized webinars that are pertinent to their expertise, oftentimes with national leaders in their fields because of the, that's one of, been one of the benefits of, um, you know, being in these Zoom meetings is you can connect with people all over the country and all over the world. But I want to implore everyone to look at this challenging time as an opportunity not to find fault like tonight's first speaker chose to do, but to acknowledge the hard work recognize we don't have all the answers and be willing to sit down and discuss what we need and hear from all of our stakeholders, including our students. Mm -hmm. so let's, let's agree to approach students and educators from an asset-based perspective, pool the strengths we have, provide the resources needed, approach challenges with patience and agree to be part of the solution. Because if there's one thing I learned in spades this summer, it's that for every solution, there are unintended challenges and always mm -hmm. Thank you. Try, can I just finish the last sentence? Try to anticipate them and then together work through them in spirit so that many of our educators, um, just, just as they've shown through their volunteer spirit throughout the summer, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And that concludes public comment for this item. Thanks, Mr. Hugh. Thank you, Ms. McBride. And to the staff for that incredibly uh, detailed uh, report and all the work, it's really important for us to dive in. And I'll just start before we open up to the board. Um, I would love for this presentation to be sent out in a parent square. I've been sending out the previous presentations left and right when parents ask me questions. It's so chock full of good information. So that's just how I wanted to start this conversation. Um, but then I'll, I'll let my board members, uh, fellow board members speak first and open up to questions. Ms. Ford, I see your hand first. Oh, thanks. Um, I totally agree. This is such a, a wonderful comprehensive report and most, our community must see it as soon as possible. It not only reveals a tremendous amount of research and data collection, creativity, collaboration, and plain old hard work, but this plan really re is responsive to the dozens and dozens of concerns and worries that have been raised by the community and also by the board. So um, I'm particularly uh, 
so happy about the efforts to address the emotional well-being of students and staff and parents, uh, the team approach, community approach to child care, uh, the efforts to keep our schools so clean and socially distanced so that teachers feel safe in their classrooms. I'm so excited that many will be teaching from their classrooms and, um, and also just all the opportunities for professional development, instructional support and, and tech that is out there. So it's great. I do just have a couple questions. I think they're both for Dr. Wagonick. The first one is, um, I might have missed it because I was kind of studying the graphic, but I'm wondering what's the difference between the passive screening that people do at home, and if they don't do that at home, they'll come and have active screening. What's that? Uh, so active screening is, uh, if folks do the passive screening at home, um, then they get cleared. Uh, we will still do temperature checks um, for students when they come in, but temperature checks, I mean, literally take five seconds. Um, but an active screen means that they um, are screened by one of our nurses or health assistants uh, to ask them the questions about their exposure, their symptoms, and with the students especially, you know, take a look at them. How do they look? Are they outwardly showing symptoms? And if so, then they need to go over and, um, and be seen for a secondary screening. So it's really a way of expediting the process, but regardless, um, and when that time comes and we get closer to students returning to campus, um, I'll share with the board um, a more in-depth um, uh, explanation of how it will all work. So I appreciate that. I was referring to the teachers though, that will be coming on campus uh, to teach from their classrooms. Will right. they doing passive screening at home before coming in? They are. So um, we created um, a Google Doc that, um, in fact, it's not just the school sites. We're doing it at the district office. So I actually screen myself each morning, take my temperature. I report that in and it goes to Ms. Maldonado. She's, she's my supervisor and has to make sure that I'm safe. So we're all doing that. But let's say I wake up tomorrow after a long board meeting and I forget to screen and I show up, then I have to do it as soon as I get here. And so we do have thermometers on site and um, I would answer the questions and fill it in. So. Great, thanks. The, the second question has to do with the enrollment decrease because even though I know it's not as key an issue because of the way we're funded, I, I'm always worried about losing kids. And so I'm just wondering if you have any other details about the trends in the, the enrollment decreases. Personally, I'm worried about kindergarten since it's not required by the state. And I'm just wondering if the principals are, are calling all of the prospective kindergarten parents or if, if you are worried about kindergarten. Um, I'm reserving judgment but watching it there has been more drop off in kindergarten and tk than there has been um, but we've had it all the way through sixth grade and in fact la colina saw a drop off of about um, 15 students and so um, we're watching it we will be doing a 10-day count um, as well at the beginning of the school year to um, see who shows up and who doesn't um, folks uh, and we're working on ways to check and make sure that students are actually enrolled in a school. So are, is someone requesting their records? Um, that sort of thing. Have they um, filed for a homeschool affidavit, private school affidavit, that sort of thing. So um, we do want to make sure folks are in school and we'll be working with our DA, DA um, truancy program on that because that's our obligation. So. Thank you. Thank you. Who, uh, Ms. sims Bowden. Thank you. Thank you. This, this report was very, very comprehensive. It just added on to the last report uh, that we, we last had. And I, I share uh, 
this caps president's caps point of getting this out to our parents and out to the community how you know how comprehensive it is answering so many questions even questions to folks who don't have kids in the district there's some impact there so it's a really good thing and i encourage you to to get that out as as she pointed out earlier so I have a couple questions just to to add on to uh, miss ford so uh, Dr. Wagner, is it a trend that's happening in terms of schools declining enrollment, not just in our district? Is that something you look look to as well um, with regards to that? I think time will time will tell. Um, need to reach out to Ann Hubbard in Hope and Donna Lewis in Goleta, et cetera, and see if they're experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it'll be, I mean, just nationwide, it's going to be interesting to see where things land. Um, uh, I think people are just trying to make sense of what's best in a time that doesn't make sense, you know, so. Right. Because we're, we're, oh, Meg, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I, um, I meet with the CBOs in, in the whole Santa Barbara County. And they're all experiencing that. Major family by a whole families are leaving. Some parents are um, not even going to do anything educational wise. They're just going to let their kids stay home. And I was shocked to hear that. Um, but yes, the it's a countywide decline. And we're very fortunate that we're not an LCFF district right now. Yeah, I, I would just add on that, you know, at the county we're looking at as we're looking to reopen the, 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 the community in general, we're seeing whether parents are coming back, uh, not because they don't have childcare, but maybe they've just changed their mind that they want to keep their children home. So I just wonder how we're going to support that just change, you know, theoretically change because people are feeling a little anxious about, you know, sending their kids back to school. So um, that's something that also we're looking at too. And I, I want to share that data with you too, if that helps in any way in terms of if parents are, you know, deciding they're, they're not going to come back to work, you know, therefore childcare needs are different or they just, they just do not feel safe about doing it. They would rather stay at home uh, with regards to it. So we're seeing some of those similar issues that are coming across as we're uh, re, uh, reopening the county in, in some ways, of course, depending on how safe we can we can do that. And so, of course, I, I have a fiscal question, Meg. So um, with regards to the, the pie chart that you showed us, is that only the external dollars that we've received and not our own pot of money internally? Yes, we're only, so far, we're only using our CARES money, the money we've received either from the feds or the state. Okay, and so those five sources are all external dollars that 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 we've applied for or been eligible to to get in terms of that. And so, could you could you in the future show some dollar amounts to those percentages so that because there wasn't a, a wasn't a full total of what they really came up to be. So just so we kind of know if it's if it's fifty million and nine percent is going to supplies or whatever, you could be a little yeah. you could do that add that to that pet. That would be really great. Um, so th those are the questions that I have. And again, the comment I would have, that's a very comprehensive report. It's, it's, it's something you can take and really be in, in, in several discussions. And so I could certainly take it to a county department head discussion and talk about how that, because we're very correlating uh, with regards to what's going on in the school district, certainly even what's going on with our employees in the county. So well done. Continue to keep up the, the good work with that. Um, and uh, it just shows the, the tireless work that you all have been putting in. And so, so much appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. Dr. Reed. Thank you. Um, just to, yes, reiterate uh, for my fellow board members, um, the idea, again, I appreciate the idea of sending this report out because it is amazing, uh, comprehensive report uh, with so much detail, but also important information that um, I'm going to just highlight in a couple of minutes, a, a couple of questions. But um, I think the idea of following up on the trends and keeping us abreast of those trends would be really important. So as we move forward, uh, Dr. Wagner, as you see these trends occur, or as you look at them, and you, that we kind of see uh, where we're going and, and, and what we are facing potentially or not, um, depending on the fluctuations that occur. Um, 
one of the uh, things I wanted to share that my appreciation was the peak slide, the, the utilizing of online tutoring. I remember thinking about that last spring and asking that question and saying, well, how is this being um, brought forward? How are we continuing to support our students? And so I really appreciated that. My question sort of as a follow-up to that, and maybe that's to Ms. Carey, is um, I know we're now stepping back and we don't have community service for students. Um, is there an opportunity here that we could um, provide tutoring on a larger scale uh, that students who could perhaps, it could be linked to community service in some way, but an opportunity for students to do online tutoring, not just within the peak framework, but in a larger scale. Um, just knowing that we have many students that could probably use that support as well. It's just an idea. I don't know if that's something that's even viable, but it just came to mind in that um, there are probably a lot of students who would appreciate having peer-to-peer -peer contact via remote, but connections other connections with other students and ways to support with each other. So I'm just, that's just a thought. I didn't know if that was a consideration or if that is too big of a bite to take at this point. No, not at all. We, I wanna be clear about one thing. So we're suspending the community service requirement, but that doesn't mean that nobody can be doing anything that constitutes or could be defined as community service. Um, so it's really about lifting that pressure that you have to stay on track toward your 60 hours in your four years of high school, even though we haven't had anything resembling normalcy in our society <laughs> in terms of in-person interactions. So it's still fine for students to pursue community service and service learning and to do good deeds. We want that in, in students and all of our students um, if, they, if they see fit to do that. And actually we have, get, we have guidelines for tutoring, for guest speakers and for other volunteers. We produced those last spring because um, tutors are one, they're sort of one component of all the ways that we enrich and support primary instruction. But think about our partners and ed partners. We had lots of asks last spring that we actually initially were a little overwhelmed by because we had to figure out the Zoom protocols and the privacy and and all those kinds of matters, but we develop protocols and, and a whole continuum of supports that allow for those types of interactions. So, so that's not at all too big an ask. It's something that we can support. Great. I'm just thinking if, if you know, it's one thing for a student to hear they don't have to do it or because of the challenge of it, but if it's provided in such a way that there is opportunities here, though, that you could step forward to that you're not being restrained from, but you know, that you could, you know, seek out if you wanted. And yeah, all three of our large high schools have that, um, that's built in seminar kind of a time where we rely heavily on peer to peer tutoring. And so we will talk in our principals meetings about what that looks like in the distance learning model, but we have protocols to support that. Great. Uh, another, um, I just wanted to commend um, Superintendent Maldonado and the bringing the resource materials for the students. I mean, you know, they're gonna get a box and they're gonna get materials and that's like so exciting for the first day of school. I just think that's a great way to start, you know, like here you go, you know, here, because they're, you know, they're, they're gonna, it's gonna connect them, I think, to the school and feel like they're getting these, you know, these packages of, of wonderful things that they can, you know, I don't know what I would do without my post-its. So I, I, I live by post-its. Um, so anyway, I think it was a great idea and I, I just think that's wonderful. Um, I also, Dr. Becchio, I appreciated your um, comment around doing a deeper dive around really looking at outreach for um, faculty outside of our area and really looking for a diverse teaching force. And so um, I'm just wondering, um, have you thought, you know, I think that was actually a key aspect of um, of one of, of the of the requests by um, the Black Lives Matter students, which was really, what are we doing specifically to promote diverse faculty and staff or the teaching? So I guess I'm throwing it out to you. You said that that was something that you were doing, and I wondered, were you seeking it outside of the community? Because I think that was one of their comments too. 
Yeah, our our students, um, you know, I I presented, I answered one of the questions that day around um, the things that we can do locally. Um, some of the uh, work we've done with the Peak Fellows and and the work with um, Antioch and City College in that pathway, but a student did express um, the desire to have a teacher workforce that also is recruited from outside Santa Barbara that brings in different viewpoints, um, and and that was that was a really important point. Um, I actually. Um, that is, when I say deep dive, that's the kind of thing between now and December that we really want to have a, a strategic response around how we're going to recruit um, outside. Yes, um, living here is expensive, but I've been to a couple job fairs and um, there's, there's interest in trying to start a life here coming out of a, a credential program. And so um, I, it's not impossible, particularly um, some of our very new teachers. So um, we're going to have a series of meetings um, and brainstorm, look at current practices around recruitment, and then any gaps that can be filled to um, just do a better job at the recruitment side. And the hiring, um, the hiring practices, that's really just taking a look at our internal practices around hiring, the questions we asked, the screening process that we we use to paper screen, um, uh, who we have on panels, and so that'll be a deep dive into the the hiring aspect of that. There's a whole other side to this, which is retention of employees, that I think is really really important. But between now and December, I really want to hit on the recruitment and hiring aspects. So I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm just, so I look forward to you sharing that. I appreciate you bringing that up tonight. Remember, remember the, um, we are talking primarily about the teacher workforce and, and our hiring, our hiring timeline is really starts around March through July. So um, that's why right now in the fall, we can take some time to do that deep dive about what practices we're going to put in place for the next hiring season. Thank you. And thank you for, um, you know, I really appreciated that you reflected on that and then you really have made that an effort because I do think that's a key effort we need to make. Um, and just to finish up with um, my just thrill that ethnic studies is, you know, rolling out, you know, that, that this is happening after two years, that um, that it's, it's, it's happening and to actually say it's happening. And I know it has come with a lot of challenges, um, a lot of important feedback from the community, from um, many, many community groups who um, have every right and should be involved in this process and have um, brought forward concerns and questions that I'm hoping um, we continue to look at and meet. And certainly, I know the, the forum was postponed, but I know, Ms. Carey, that um, the plan is to reinvigorate another one um, and continue. It's, a, it's always going to be an ongoing process. I think we have to look at this as a fluid process as well. And I, I just want to acknowledge um, the efforts of um, certainly Ms. Carey and your leadership in the district of really working around and finding ways to, to make sure that uh, through many board meetings and processes and committee meetings that we get to a place that we actually approve it as a full board and then to then continue that process that what we need to do is continue to reflect on the work. And I, it was great to hear about the new faculty. It was great to hear about the courses that are being developed. And, um, and to also feel very, very proud as a district that we are one of the first districts to be implementing this. I mean, we were ahead of the game. We were ahead of the curve. And I think being ahead of the curve, we ran into a lot more roadblocks than I think other districts will run into. But I also think it's positioned us to be that much closer to be doing the right and important work around culturally relevant pedagogy, 
which is an important impact that we need to make happen for all of our students to feel that they can see themselves in the curriculum. And so one last thing just to impress upon the fact that though this is happening in our secondary level and that it's happening and I acknowledge that and I'm just so thrilled, I just wanna reiterate again the importance of how this needs to start early on. It needs to start in elementary and we need to see if that may be more transparently what we are doing to integrate culturally relevant pedagogy within that framework of elementary aged kids. Because by the time they get to ethnic studies in high school, they should be having such amazing more involved culturally cross-cultural conversations and really understanding their identity and themselves. And that goes for all students because we all benefit from it. It's a benefit for all cultures, all ethnicities, with from also from ELD students, from LGBTQ, from persons with disabilities. It's all relevant and it's all important. So I just want to acknowledge us as a district as being a spearhead towards this and also to um, respect again the community voices and to continue to respect them to have ensure that they have a voice continuing through this process. So um, thank you for all of your work on that. And again, whew, we got a lot of work to do, but what amazing work has happened. And I'm just exhausted listening to all that you've done, but it sounds so energizing. So like I'm exhausted, but I'm energized because I see like, wow, we have so much positive work going on here. So. I just kind of like do like a wave to all of you here on the screen and I know for all the teachers who are going to be stepping out next week, um, just so proud and, and look forward to hearing again their stories. So thank you all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, Ms. Munoz. Well, yeah, so as my board member, you know, Dr. Reed said, and as my fellow board member said, you know, just impressive, comprehensive report of all the effort that's gone into it, you know, all the, just all the meals that have been served um, by food services and all that flexibility in terms of, um, you know, budgeting and so forth and, and more to come. So I, you know, applaud the food services director for your leadership on that um and you know can't words or you know words can't even say it it's um beyond words in terms of the effort of everyone in the cabinet um the leadership the um that has been uh demonstrated and ethnic studies i mean you know a student-led movement that um cause the creation of ethnic studies and continuing that dialogue. Um, I couldn't say it better than Dr. Reed, you know, just to continue to have the student voices heard and have the courses um, taught that they're requesting and thinking outside of the boxes, as <clears throat> um, Mr. Becchio said, in terms of uh, recruiting uh, teachers outside of, of Santa Barbara and just bringing all that wealth of knowledge here um, in a culturally diverse, um, sensitive manner. So it, you know, I could go on and on, but it, I'm sure you don't want to hear me for another half hour. But I just, you know, thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. Okay, I'm going to just be respectful of time. I've got a couple questions, but I'm going to do them really quickly and um, uh, pause in between because they're for different people. So on the first one on ethnic studies, Ms. Carey, could you please clarify there's um, just where one might find the new curriculum that's being introduced this fall because I've seen some stuff floating around on Facebook that is not the curriculum. So could you just succinctly say if a parent or anybody in the community is curious about this curriculum, what should they do? You can go to our the website and then as of newly today, we put an announcement on the home page that will take you right there. Um, so from the from the home screen, there's a, a kind of a button an icon and the header that says what is ethnic studies in Santa Barbara visit our new web page and that'll take you to the page where you'll see the curriculum. Um, which includes the course outlines from June 9th board meeting, but also sample sample lessons and again um, uh, an overview of the texts that are used. Thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, second question is on, related to the attendance numbers, um, what options, and I believe that I'll just toss this to our superintendent, what options are there for families who want to stay enrolled but might want to do a modified independent study, et cetera. Um, Ms. Maldonado or maybe maybe another um, team member. Yeah, I can speak to that and Sierra and Sean can jump in if I miss something, but um, there is an opportunity for parents who feel that their children will need a modified learning plan to engage with their principals uh, in figuring out a plan that would work for them. There, is some, there are some requirements from the State Department, a daily check-in with the school site or the teacher there's engagement logs that they would need to provide um, with evidence of learning, that their students are making progress. There's an agreement that needs to be signed between the parent and the teacher on the expectation, expectations for students. And then of course, uh, our responsibility as a school district is to ensure that students are not falling behind. If they are, we'll have to continue talking with parents about that. Um, in order to Facilitate any kind of modified learning plans as a school district will need to figure out if there's a large number of requests and um, put in place personnel that would be able to support and um, monitor any types of modified learning plans that parents need. Thank you so much. So the short answer is schools will work with students and families to try to make something work. I just think this is such a um, new terrain and to not feel as though everybody's going to be sort of forced into it one certain schedule, but rather I've just heard it myself from uh, the, my, the principal of my son's school, just ability to work with each and every family. I know that there's that strong desire. So I just wanted to make sure that was communicated and thanks for that explanation. Um, my third question is on um, outdoor learning. I've gotten a lot of questions. I'm obviously a huge proponent of when we can open safely to really utilize our spaces. Uh, and I hope this can be an ongoing conversation. But is there any movement now from the state, those of you who are in more regular contact with the Department of Education to allow some sort of outdoor education now? I, I kind of know the answer to this, but I think it's important for the community to just hear if the, if you've heard any rumblings of potential opening in that regard that might be some of a cohort situation on an outdoor field, et cetera. Anything like that? I can speak to that. I was actually in a meeting today with the uh, public health officer and other local superintendents in the South County area. Actually, it's both North and South County. Um, they're still not allowing us to use our spaces the way that um, we would want to. And it feels a little bit uh, disingenuous when we say we're going to provide childcare for our families, but yet we can't open our schools for other uh, things like outdoor education. We're, we continue to press on the public health officer to find out what are some of the things that we can do to make that happen. But to, as of today, it could change tomorrow, but as of today, uh, we are still not allowed, but it doesn't stop us from planning and being thoughtful about, like Sierra said earlier, looking at our curriculum, looking at overall learning, so that it's not just about being outside learning, but really being uh, outside using the space and the place as part of our classroom. Thanks for that answer. I think it's important for the community to know that we are in favor of these options and right now that those doors haven't been opened but uh, we're in conversation and the ideas I, I hear a lot of them they should keep coming because that helps inform the way in which we can through you all can advocate for more flexibility in the governor's mandate so uh, thanks for affirming that that's what I was hoping you would say and it was good to hear Ms. Sims Moten did you have a question on that point yeah, I was just going to add to your point because I just had someone was pretty upset today when I was on a phone call about the fact that they felt we weren't using the outside space, but it's important that just to hear this clarification, so I'm glad you brought that up as well. To we, are have, we have some uh, limitation as to what we do. It doesn't mean that that's not we, we, what we want to do. So this is really good to be able to share and take that back to that person who felt like we just weren't even using it as an option. So great. So hopefully we'll continue to, to work toward that effort. And to add a little more context, I've been, we've been also asked about special education students who we know would even need, you know, double down on our supports in this, in this um, space, asking about small group instruction for some of those students. Can we do that? We know the ratio of teachers students could be small. They could be social distance. And again, we are still being told no. 
but we keep pushing and we keep asking and but, and don't forget, uh, board members that I said to you before, we still have a team of people that are thinking about what it'll look like when we come back right. to um, a hybrid model or perhaps even full on. Uh, I would just like to ask the community and everyone to please help us bring the rates down by practicing our social distancing, wearing our masks, and doing everything that it takes for us to get this under control. That is a great message to end on. Um, I really appreciate all of the work um, and I just want to end my point by what uh, Ms. Barnwell said about the wish list. Uh, everywhere I go, I've been saying to people to donate to the Santa Barbara Education Foundation. That's the mechanism by which we can purchase headphones. We can purchase help offset food costs because of all the food costs. So sbefoundation.org. As board members, we can uh, solicit donations. Uh, the, there was such a strong will amongst the community to be in this together. We all are in this together. So. Um, I look forward to that wish list when it comes out. And just again, thanks to everybody. I think that's my last comment and my question. So Ms. Maldonado, I'll let you wrap it up. Actually, everyone, tonight is a meteor show. So <laughs> it's a great night to go out and look up at the sky in the next couple of days. So as we talk about science and outdoor classrooms, we can still look outside and learn. So thank you. Excellent. So uh, we now have just a couple more agenda items, always the fun ones. Item I, which is coming events. Obviously the big one is first day of school. Anybody else have any coming events that we should note for the community? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to future agenda items, item J. Um, I have a couple uh, that I wanted to put forward. I'll follow up with emails to the staff, um, but you know that you know, we're moving into the school year. Um, some of the things we talked about in March, including um, a, a gun safety resolution, Dr. Wagnick, I would like to, we are working on a resolution about gun storage and uh, we are at a time in our country where gun purchasing is at an all time high. And so I want to follow up with a, a note to you that I'd love to bring that agenda, um, that resolution back around uh, at a future board me meeting soon. Great. Secondly, um, I've gotten a question from the community on Peabody Stadium. So Mr. Vizzolini, uh, wherever you might be this evening, I would love to have an update for the board at some certain, uh, some future date that's convenient to you. Any other agenda items from the board members? You can also email me uh, and the team and Ms. Maldonado. Dr. Reed, did you have one? No, I just wanted to, we, there is still a chart of agenda items that we can still need to, to get to. Yeah. So, yeah, so I guess, so I, I, I don't remember. But what there the, weren't, there uh, aren't any on, there weren't any current on there at this okay. point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we still have some left over. Yes. We're actually yeah. getting back to, I mean, um, the pandemic has obviously rightly so taken over for the last several months and now it's time to return to some of these ongoing items. Ms. Ford. Uh, well, you and I were thinking along the same lines. I bet other board members were too. So I asked uh, Steve Vizzolini today about the stadium and this is what he wrote. The stadium is very close. We received the letter of substantial completion from the architect last week. That means that all of the division of the state architect required elements have been completed and certified. The contractor is now working on punch list items. And as soon as that work is done, we can install the track service and call it done. Excellent. Well, that was non agenda So no comment from board members on that brief update, but uh, thank you for that, Ms. Ford. Okay. Um, that leaves us to, unless I see any, I'm just doing a quick scan of the Zoom here. Thanks to the community for uh, hanging in here and listening to this meeting and, and participating and to our speakers and to our staff for all the work. Keep it up. It's a uh, first day of school in one week and we're excited and I am happily and with gratitude uh, calling this meeting complete. Um, thank you everybody. It's now 1023 and we are adjourned. <laughs>